to justice. However, there are a number of cases that go unsolved as many in the black community live by the street code, snitches get stitches. So while mainstream media and Democrat leaders want me to live in fear of the police and have great concern for white supremacy, I'm actually at a greater risk of being harmed in my own community by someone that looks like me than I am by a white police officer. That concerns me. It should concern us. The political left has thrived for generations by keeping Americans divided. Racial tensions and fear are two of the most powerful mechanisms they exploit. That's why leftists and the liberal media keep telling the black community that we are perpetual victims of police brutality while ignoring the real issues that damage black Americans. It's time for black Americans to break free from this trap. It's time to walk away. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like it and share it with all of your friends. And please subscribe to our channel by clicking this button here. Hi, my name is Scott Pressler, or as some of you may know me from Twitter, The Persistence. Many of you walked away from the Democrat Party, but you may still be registered to vote as a Democrat. Did you know that you need to re-register to vote in order to change your party affiliation? That's why I'm here, to give you some easy tips and tricks on voter registration. The easiest way to register to vote is to go to vote.gov. Notice, I said gov, G-O-V, which indicates government. There's another website out there called vote.org. This is a website done by the Democrats to try to trick you into giving them your information. You need to register to vote at your current address. So if you have moved recently, make sure to change your voter registration to your new address. And if you have walked away from the Democrat Party, congratulations on becoming a free thinker. Make sure that you're not registered to vote as a Democrat. If you're a student attending college in a state that is different from where your home is, you have the option to register to vote at your college address. So let's say that you live in California, but you're going to school in Florida. Because you've walked away from the Democrat Party and California is more likely to go Democrat in a presidential election, you can register to vote in Florida. This gives your vote more power, especially in a swing state. So you may be thinking, Scott, I've walked away from the Democrat Party. How do I get other people registered to vote? While registering to vote online, you can also ensure that other people get registered to vote by following these steps. For the majority of states, all you have to do is go to your local voter registration office to get forms, have other people fill out the voter registration forms, and turn in the completed forms to your voter registration office. These 36 states, which require no training in order to register voters, include important swing states like Iowa, Maine, Michigan, North Carolina, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Be fun and creative when registering voters. You can wear your walk away shirts and hats or even set up a table. Your goal is to be wherever people are, whether it's beaches, parks, fairs, festivals, tailgates, or town centers. The rule is to talk to everyone. I don't care if you see a young girl with green hair who is pierced and tatted from head to toe. She may have walked away from the Democrat Party. You don't know. And every single person represents an opportunity to register new voters. But first, you need to make sure people have walked away from the Democrat Party. 
So, you've got your clipboard, pen, and voter registration forms. You walk up to people and say, I walked away from the Democrat Party. How do you feel about that? Or, would you like to know why? After briefly sharing your experience, and if the person indicates that he or she agrees with you, your first word should be, are you registered to vote at your current address? If they are not registered to vote, you can then say, I can register you to vote right here, right now, in two minutes flat. Once you have registered new voters, all you have to do is turn in the completed forms to your local voter registrar. It's that easy. There are some states, however, which require training in order to register voters. These include Colorado, Georgia, Illinois, Maryland, New Mexico, Texas, and Virginia. Once you have completed the required training, you'll follow the same process for how to identify people who have walked away from the Democrat Party and get them registered. North Dakota is the only state which doesn't have voter registration. Similarly, New Hampshire and Wyoming do not allow third-party voter registration. So, if you live in one of these states, you can do petition drives. Instead of voter registration forms, your approach is exactly the same, except you'll ask people to sign your walkaway petition. Your goal is to identify new people who agree with walking away from the Democrat Party and get them to join your local group. These individuals can become activists, organizers, and help you find more people who have walked away. All I'm asking is for every person to register five new voters, just five. If each of us does our part, we can create millions of new voters in time for the 2020 presidential election. You've walked away from the Democrat Party. Now it's time to walk into your local voter registration office to pick up some forms and get to work. And if you meet any unregistered voters who want to keep America great, don't let them walk away. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Are you guys ready? All right. My name is Nick Miles. I'm the event coordinator here at Walk Away. Just wanted to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Thank you for everyone watching at home. It's going to be a fantastic night. I do have to give a disclaimer, and if you've been to any of our rallies, you know this disclaimer. The Walkaway Foundation, which is a 501c3, does not support any, any does not support or endorse any direct candidate, organization, cause, or business that is in attendance today. We're speaking at this event. Without further ado, I would like to introduce my boss, and I would like you guys to meet the founder of the Walkaway Campaign, Brandon Strzok. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Walk Away. Let's see if I can get this all out. Walk Away, Black Americans Left versus Black Americans Right, Culture War Showdown, Live Debate. It's close enough, right? Close enough. So I want to start off, first of all, before we get started, I want to thank a few people. Uh, I would like to give a shout out to Cecilia Johnson. Is she here tonight? All right. Thank you, Cecilia Johnson. I want to give a uh, thank you to Deontay Johnson, too, uh, and his organization, the Black Conservative Federation. And Phil Bell from FreedomWorks. as well as all of the great folks from Getter. Are they here tonight? The Getter team? I, that's what I thought. The Getter team. Good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. So you might be asking yourselves, um, why is this white gay dude throwing a black event, encouraging black people to get together and debate the issues? Here's why. Several years ago, I made a decision to walk away from a political party that I felt no longer represented me. After years of supporting this party, I did a lot of homework and a lot of research, and what I felt was that I was being lied to and I was being manipulated, largely by media sources and sources like this that we trust in this country, getting misinformation. 
I believe that this is happening for minority communities in this country all across the board, with your black, brown, LGBT, women, religious minorities, immigrants, etc. I believe that we're being exploited, used, manipulated, and oftentimes lied to. It doesn't even matter to me necessarily which political party you align with, but we are being used as a wedge and a tool for a lot of misinformation. And so for me, it felt really important when I started the Walkaway organization to put a particular focus on minority com communities, encourage people to get together and revisit the belief systems that we've had for so long. When we were doing Walkaway testimonials, which by the way are coming back very soon, and I'll explain that in just a moment, When we received a lot of testimonials from people in the black community, every type of walkaway testimonial was different. Everyone had their own story, but different communities had different common themes. And what we heard oftentimes from a lot of people who were making testimonials in the black community was that there was almost a generational voting pattern. A lot of people said, you know, I didn't put that much thought into what I believed because I was, that's what my grandmother believed. That's what my grandfather believed. That's what my parents believed. But what I want to encourage people to do now, again, no matter what side of the aisle you align on, is do a gut check and do a mental check right now. Let's revisit the issues and let's revisit the conversation. And let's ask ourselves, have the belief systems that we've had for so long and the political parties that we've supported so long, do they still represent us? Are they doing well for ourselves and for our community? Is it time to consider thinking differently, making different choices, and revisiting the belief systems that we've had for so long. That's why I believe that conversations like we're about to have tonight are so important. And that's why I believe getting members of the black community together to talk about the issues that are important is vital and crucial to us coming together and healing the divide that exists in this country. Do you guys agree? You know, with Walk Away, uh, I've often made a lot of sort of references to the movie A League of Their Own. Uh, it's, there's a lot of similarities, like there's no crying and walk away, although there is. My, my team and I have, I think, cried many times when we're doing events. But there's another scene in the movie A League of Their Own where Tom Hanks is talking to Gina Davis when she's about to quit the team in the middle of the season. She's about to go home. And she says to him, it just got too hard. And he says back to her, if it wasn't hard everyone would do it. It's the hard that makes it great. This event was a very hard event to do. Even this morning, we lost another panelist. And then we found a replacement about an hour ago. <laughs> and that was after we lost a panelist two days ago. So, yes, up until the last minute, this is why, by the way, for those of you, thank you for uh, indulging us. I know we're going on a little bit late. That is the reason why. And please, if you could give a big uh, round of applause to Rashad Singleton, who's filling in at last minute for the left team. And as a matter of fact, he's not even here yet. He's throwing his suit on. He's going to be here shortly. So quite literally, we're going to get the event kicked off. We're going to get started, and he's going to be joining us a few minutes into the event. So don't be weirded out if he just walks up on the panel in the middle of the event. And um, the other thing I want to encourage, no matter what side of the aisle any of you align with, I want to just give, also please give a round of applause to all of our panelists on the left, because I, it's not lost on me that this is a walkaway event. I'm a person who walked away from the left and ended up going over to the right. Although we say walk away is a journey, not a destination, we just encourage people to think for themselves, go on that journey of research and doing their own homework. It's not the easiest thing in the world to come to a debate event where the people throwing the event are your political opponents. And that's not lost on me. So they deserve a huge amount of respect for showing up tonight and having this conversation. And we appreciate it so, so much. And I believe with that, we're about ready to get kicked off. Uh, all I'll say is two quick things, uh, and then we'll get the event started. The first is, if you like conversations like you're about to hear tonight, which again, I think are so important and so rare, this type of thing needs to happen more often, please support the Walkaway Foundation. 
These types of events don't happen often, again, because they're very, very, very hard to do, and I'm just stupid enough to keep putting myself through the process of doing this over and over again, because I think it's really important. But we're going to keep going, and we're going to keep doing this, and we want to have these debate events for the Hispanic community. We want to do it for the LGBT, there you go, for the Asian community. Okay. Sorry, I thought you were Asian. It's a little bright up here. She's Hispanic. All right, sorry. <laughs> See, we can all learn. Um, so, <laughs> no, and, and also, it's not just about the minority communities, too. There are lots of issues. We want to do debate events where we get PTA moms from both sides of the aisle discussing what's happening in America's classrooms. Uh, we want to talk about immigration. We want to talk about policy-based events, debate events. This is the type of thing we want to do more of. So if you love the conversation that you see tonight and you want to see more of this type of format and you want to support an organization that's willing to do the hard work to make these events a success, please get behind the Walkaway Foundation. We encourage everyone to please be a monthly recurring supporter. You can go to walkawayfoundation.org and sign up. Even a dollar a month goes a long way if enough people do that. If you can give more, please do support Walkaway Foundation. Last thing I'll say is we know how much you guys loved the Walkaway testimonials that were circulating several years ago. All different types of Americans from all different types of backgrounds telling their stories about why they're waking up and walking away. Facebook banned the Walk Away campaign in January of 2021, and like that, we lost all of those tens of thousands of videos and written testimonials. All of that content was gone. My team and I have been working relentlessly for the last year and a half building our own social media platform, Walk Away Social. That is going to be coming very, very soon. Yes. And you can back me up on this, correct? It's real. It's very real. People are like, you're lying. You've been saying that for months. No, it's real. It is real, and it really is coming. So be on the lookout for Walkaway Social. It's coming very, very soon. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's kick off the Walkaway. Let's see if I can do it again. Black Americans Left versus Black Americans Right Culture War Showdown Live Debate. Getting our event kicked off tonight, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening who will get the show kicked off and introduce our panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gothics. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this amazing event. Good evening, America, and welcome to the Walkaway Culture War Showdown, Black Americans Left versus Black Americans Right live debate. My name is Gothics. I am a social and political commentator on YouTube. Tonight, we are broadcasting live from the Washington, D.C. at Ronald Reagan Building Amphitheater. We'd like to first start this evening by giving a very special thank you to this event's sponsor, Dr. Bob Shillman, and his organization, the Shillman Foundation. Dr. Bob's generous grant is what has enabled this debate to take place. The Walk Away campaign team is beyond excited to present the showdown America has been waiting for. Nothing has divided the American people more than the topic of race. This division has fallen solid, solidly across political lines Narrative, uh, narratives assert that one political party is synonymous with racism, bigotry, white supremacy, and hate, while another political party is credited as being the party of tolerance, diversity, and opportunity. What is the truth hidden behind the, con the contention? Is America a racist country? Do we remain chained within a structure of systemic racial oppression? Or are we all being lied to and manipulated as a means to a political end? Tonight, Walkaway is tearing down the walls of division and shining a spotlight on the topics that everyone else is too afraid to touch. Tonight, for the first time ever, a panel of left-wing political and cultural experts will, will debate a panel of right-wing political and cultural experts on topics such as critical race theory, the Black Lives Matter movement, racism, white supremacy, systemic oppression, the black family, crime, economy, Trump, Biden, and so much more. Let's meet tonight's panelists. Starting off with the left team, we have attorney Robert Patillo. <laughs> a 
Attorney Patillo has worked with and advised Reverend Jesse Lee Jackson for over 20 years and is a highly sought after speaker and organizer in the fields of civil and human rights. Attorney Patillo has worked as a political organizer and the political strategist for over 25 years, as well as practicing civil rights law for over a decade in his law practice at the Patillo Law Group, LLC. Patillo is also a national voice in media, hosting his weekly radio show, People, Passion, Politics, on News Talk, on News and Talk 1380 WAOK, as well as daily press appearances on Fox News, CNN, OAN, Newsmax, Real America's Voice, and various other outlets. Next, we have M. Reese Everson. Best-selling author, Best-selling author, women's rights activist, legal analyst, and attorney, M. Reese Everson, is known around the world for her straight, no chasers legal commentary delivered weekly on international outlets into 700 million households in more than 100 countries and 85 million in the U.S. Next we have, uh, well, we're actually waiting on one more person for the left, so we're going to introduce the right right now, and this is Delano Squires. Delano is a research fellow in the Richard and Helen uh, DeVos Center for Life, Religion, and Family at the Heritage Foundation. He is also a contributor to Blaze Media, who writes about faith, family, and culture, as well as Blaze TV's Fearless with Jason Whitlock podcast. His articles and his essays have been published by Newsweek, the Institute for Family Studies, Black and Married with Kids, The Root, The Griot, and The Federalist. Next up is Shamika Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Shamika is an author, speaker, and certified professional life coach. She is the co-host of Cut the Bull podcast, contributor of Fearless with Jason Whitlock on Blaze TV, walkaway all-star, and political commentator seen on Fox News, Newsmax, and Sky News Australia. A dedicated daughter, a friend, a mother of three, she's often the topic of numerous articles, podcasts, TV, and radio shows that love or are sometimes shocked by her transparency. <laughs> she's also been published in Jet and was formerly an official correspondent for the Six Brown Chicks featured on the Oprah Winfrey Network. And then we have Malik Abdul. <laughs> Malik is a former President George W. Bush and Barack Obama political appointee who in 2016 walked away from the Democrat Party to support Donald J. Trump. An expert in policy, government, and Capitol Hill, he has carved out a unique space as a GOP strategist and an on-air contributor dedicated to uh, demystifying the conservative movement. Okay, now here is how the format of tonight's debate will work. We flipped a coin tonight before the event, and the right team won the toss, which means the right team will be going first. Uh, the, we'll be the first uh, to answer each question, then each team will alternate who goes first on all of the following questions. So for each question, the teams will choose a first, second, or third speaker. The first speaker from each team will have two full minutes to speak, the second speaker will have one full minute to speak, and the third speaker will have 30 seconds to close out their team's arguments. Answers to each question will alternate back and forth from one team to another until all panelists have had an opportunity to respond. Panelists should not interrupt each other while speaking. However, panelists are allowed to use their own time to ask members of the opposing team questions about the topic if they so choose. Everyone understand the rules? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Then let's get started. All right. Beginning with the subject of racism. The definition of racism seems to have changed over the years. Many once understood it to mean hatred or intolerance of another race or other races. Now, however, many progressives tell us that racism is a system of group privilege by those who have a disproportionate share of society's power, prestige, property, and privilege. And therefore, only white people can be racist. So, what is the definition of racism? Okay, so panelist one on the right side. You got two minutes. I'll take it. 
Um, so my, my definition of racism is basically either ethnic hatred, ethnic partiality, so if you, you treat people differently based on their ethnicity, um, or a certain type of ethnic superiority. Given that, I think any person could be racist. I reject the notion that only white people can be racist. Um, part of the reason I reject that is because it doesn't make sense. For it, because if the definition of racism has to do with power or prestige, but only white people can be racist, then that would mean that if a black police chief fires a white police cadet for some reason, let's say he, just, he, just, he wanted fewer white people on his police um, force, then, and the police cadet walked out and he mumbled an ethnic slur under his breath, that in that particular situation, the police cadet who has no power, that's why he's getting fired, is being racist, but the police chief cannot be racist because he's black, even though he has all the power. So I reject that particular notion. Um, I think it's patronizing to think that black people or any other group other than white people can't exhibit, as I said, ethnic partiality or ethnic hatred. So um, if, if anybody believes that their particular group is superior and others are inferior, that to me is a definition of racism everyone should be able to agree to. That's what we always believe. But again, now racism means privilege plus, plus power. Um, and as I said, I reject that particular definition. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, left team, you have two minutes. Uh, well, I think that we're conflating terms because there's a term of prejudice and there's a term of racism. Racism de defined by the Supreme Court uh, in decisions by Sandra Day O'Connor and a progeny of cases thereafter, uh, which deals with, in particular, the uh, ability of the uh, majority group uh, to either negatively, uh, negatively impact the lives of another uh, group based upon their uh, racial or ethnic uh, features um, versus prejudice, which is an internal idea, the conceptualization of what another group is, say an internalized hatred. You can be prejudiced towards an individual, but without a, a power dynamic associated there with, you lose the conceptualization of racism. Uh, similar to the point which was just made, because we live in a society where um, throughout its history, you have had you've had resources distributed based upon racial lines in America. Uh, our lines for uh, for racism are drawn based upon the previous institution of slavery as it was, the Jim Crow thereafter. So I agree that, yes, if an individual is in power and uses that power to discriminate against another group, then they can be racist. We saw that this uh, last week in Los Angeles where you had the um, city council president who was Latina talking about a white individual with a uh, black son. That's a racist situation because you have somebody in a position of power able to negatively impact the lives of another person based upon their ethnic background. I think that when you uh, when you conflate the terms, then you uh, uh, you end up with specious outcomes. It's almost as Kant said, um, with the uh, idea of the categorical imperative that an individual does not need to actually hate someone to act racistly. Someone needs to only exercise the power dynamic uh, associated there with, and the negative uh, uh, impacts of that are what we describe as <coughs> systemic racism that people have here in the United States of America. So I think once you get the definitions together, it puts, us, puts you into a better position uh, to try to find a way to solve these things. Because I think more important than trying to define or to trying to categorize is what the solution should be. Right, Racism. Yeah, this, uh, <laughs> Let me help. Yeah, I've got this, I'm going to take a shot's time. No, you, we're we alternating back and forth. Okay. <laughs> Reed's about to, she's about to kill it, though. Like, she was going to kill it. <laughs> All right. Uh, panelists, two, you have one minute. Yeah, so when we're talking about racism, it's important to understand, and people are um, typically conservatives and liberals have different interpretations of that. But if you agree that race is a social construct, um, then there are different arguments that you can have. The argument that race is a social construct, it, we can actually go back to maybe 1804 and 18, or 18, 1805 or 1806, which was the Hudgens v. Wright decision. Hudgens v. Wright decision was a Supreme Court, a Virginia Supreme Court decision where the judge, there were a <clears throat> four generations, three or four generations of Native American women who were trying, who sued their slave master um, for freedom. What they had to prove is that they were not of African descent. In that particular decision, what the judge said, he used things that were stereotypical features of 
Native Africans, which were. And it's interesting, I That's encourage time. you to go back, look up Hudgens v. Wright if you want to um, have a broader discussion right. of race as a social construct, which it is. Uh, time. And I'll take it from here, Malik. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, actually, I'd actually like to direct you to another case, uh, the, Scott of, uh, the case of Dred Scott, which is really the true and clear definition of what racism is in America. Why is that? Because in Dred Scott, you had the determination that there is no right that the Negro has that the United States has to respect. Now, why is that the definition of racism? Because the creation of race in the United States of America started when Africans were brought on a boat from multiple boats from Africa to the United States and expected to be in a position of second-class citizenship or subservience for the duration of their time here. Why? Because there was some guy over in uh, the uh, in Europe who said, I want, I give you the right, the Catholic Church was part of it, but I give you the right to go into these countries and take these people based on their lineage and based on the fact that they're from Africa. You can take them and subject them to servitude for the rest of their lives. So when black people were brought here, it was based on the premise of race I'm and they were expected to be in servitude from that point until they left. We're still here. There's still racism. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to do you guys a solid and let you know when you're halfway through your time. <laughs> All right. So third panelist, you have 30 seconds. Okay. I'm fine with a traditional definition of racism, the belief that human traits are determined by race and the abilities that you have comes from race. That's the traditional definition, and I'm completely fine with it. I'm also completely fine with acknowledging what Robert has said and saying that I must be racist and prejudiced because for me, there are certain things that only a black man can do. Um, so I feel like when it comes to racism, when you wonder if Time. black people, okay. <laughs> Finish your thought. And to take, can, do I get the rest of the uh, Yeah, so. Yeah, go for it. All right. And we're back to the point of the Dred Scott case. So with the Africans being brought here, from that point on to subject to be a second class citizen, racism has been the denial of power, uh, um, right to access education, equality, resources, opportunity. Seconds. That has all been the vestiges of racism since we got here. You don't just look at racism starting with yesterday or 10 years ago. You have to look at why the people that are here are being, uh, people are being racist against them and the historical Time. picture of racism. Thank you so much. Does that come back on this side? Uh, I think that is... Everybody. That's Next everybody. question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's everybody. She had to go again because we're missing a panelist still. But he just showed up. He, so he'll he'll just be showed up. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's move on to the next question. Is America a systemically racist country? And depending on your belief, how do our laws and our constitution either support systemic racism or protect black Americans from systemic racism by guaranteeing freedom and equality? Right team, uh, first panelist, you have two minutes. Okay. Um, uh, no, I agree with Kamala Harris and Representative Jim Clyburn and Joe Biden and Tim Scott, that America is not a systemically racist country. There are vestiges of racism that obviously exist in a country. When you build a country um, where uh, many people consider slavery America's greatest sin, the original sin, when you build a country that is purposely discriminated against people of African descent, it's hard to argue that there won't be vestiges from those years. Now, we've come a very long the way. The question um, about whether or not we, you know, we're still a systemically racist country, I think that there are, well, not I think, the fact that all of us are sitting here on this panel is a testament to how far we've come. The fact that there is a mixed group of people in this room is a testament to how far we've come. No, America is not a systemic racist country, but there are vestiges that still exist today that both Republicans and Democrats have been working on. That's why Donald Trump did the work that he did when he was in office around the First Step Act and many things that he did around our HBCUs, many things that he did around, um, even if you look at NIH, making minorities competitive for NIH grants. These are the things that the federal government does, our local government does to deal with those vestiges. Are there problems? Absolutely, it's hard to deny that. Are there disparities that exist? 
it's hard to deny that when you see it in your face. But are we this angry, systemically racist country that can't move on? You know, we're still back in the 1800s. We're absolutely not. And again, the fact that we're all here on this stage together is a testament to just how far we come. We still have a way to go, but we've come a very, very long way. Okay, thank you. Left team, you have two minutes. Is America a systemic, systemically racist country? Well, let's just ask this question. If a person has rights under the Constitution, which is a contract, let's start there. The Constitution is a contract. It says in the event that we don't agree to be governed anymore, we have the right to overthrow the government. And we saw on January 6th that certain people decided to enforce that contract. They went to the steps of the Capitol and said, you know what, we don't like the way our government is working, and we decide that we want to change it. The problem is, is that there are certain people who do not have the same rights. And no matter what you believe, like I said, the Dred Scott case is very critical because that case said there is no right that America has to respect for the Negro. And so then you get people who, fast forward, are still not equal. So how do we know they're not equal? Well, according to the 13th Amendment, that was supposed to free the slaves, right? But there's a loophole in the 13th Amendment. It says that you can, that every man shall be free except in the instance of if he's convicted of a crime. So what do we have there? Well, you just pass slavery from being on a plantation and you move it right over to the criminal justice system. And we shuttle people through our criminal justice system on a daily basis. So slavery never disappeared. It was never outlawed. What does that mean? That means that certain people are still legally second-class citizens in America. And we still have that, and we know that that exists. So the mere fact of the matter is, is yes, we still have a systematic integration of slavery into our country simply because everyone's not even legally a citizen. Everyone's not free. That's why there's still systematic racism. All right, thank you very much. Uh, before we continue, I just want to welcome our third panelist for the left, uh, Rashad Singleton. <laughs> Rashad, Rashad is a seven-time published author and entrepreneur from Cam Campbellton, Florida. Sorry about that. Uh, Rashad has selected has was selected to be a part of the New York Knicks Summer League team in 2009. He also played professional overseas basketball for 12 years. Rashad wrote The Hypocrisy of Democracy, How the American Dream Became the African American Nightmare, Ode to the Black Queen, God's Greatest Creation, and Arise Brother, This is Your Call to Black Kings. He created the National Reparations League in 2020 with the sole purpose of uniting people across the country to fight and demand reparations for the descendants of enslaved people and Jim Crow. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to kick it back to the right side. Panelist two, you have one minute. Sure. Um, is America a systemically racist country? No, it is not. It is a country teeming with opportunity. Um, you don't have to deny America's ugly racial history to be able to affirm that. But the notion that criminals are second-class citizens, and I hear this trotted out often, um, along with a stat that you know, the majority of black people in, who are incarcerated are there for low-level drug crimes, which is false. Um, if, in fact, if you look at state prisons where the vast majority of the prison population is, um, murder is the second leading cause of incarceration for black males, and murder, homicide is the leading cause of death for young black men between the ages of 15 and 24. So if your position is that because guys who either rob or steal or car carjack in their communities who may look like me 50. are second-class citizens, citizens, then I would have to accept that. Other thing I'll say is this. If America was actually a systemically racist country towards black and brown people, the left would not promote immigration in the way that it, that it does. Because if, if I went to a restaurant with, that time. gave me bad service, the last thing I would do is tell all my friends and family to go there as well. All right. Thank you. All right, panelists, too, you have one minute. 
After you, brother. All right. Uh, so I find it interesting, this uh, argument about systemic racism, because, again, we're into a definitional point. Because when people say, is America systemically racist, is this, it's as if they are saying, is every single person in America racist? That's not the conceptualization that surrounds systemic racism, is whether or not the institutions which exist disproportionately dis uh, uh, disenfranchise and disaffect a certain population based upon their racial dynamics, similar to the definitional issue we had in question one. Uh, in this situation, I don't think when you look at the interstate highway system as it was constructed, the fact that it was built over black communities nationwide, if you look at the fact that throughout its history, the GI Bill was distributed towards white families more so than African American families, you can go through the system that America has created and see that it is tilted away from the prosperity and quality of African Americans. Remember that separate but equal, the problem was never the separate part. It was the equal part. So as long as we cannot accept that fundamental truth, that is well, what it will take for us to get past systemic racism in the nation. Thank you very much. Whoops. <laughs> All right, so let's bring it back to the right side. Panelist three, you have 30 seconds. Is America a systemically racist country? My answer is no, because inanimate objects cannot be racist. Uh, you know, I think we're just as racist as the people that are here. We're going to always be as racist as the people that we put in power. But if there is some certain rights that I don't have as a black person, someone forgot to tell me. Because when I woke up this morning, I was free to come and go as I please. I came here a as free as I wanted to be. And everything that I've done in life, I've done it because because I wanted to, and no one has stopped me from doing that. Come on. All right, and panelist three, you have 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, is America systemically racist? That can be answered very easily. Has America paid reparations to the descendants of slaves and Jim Crow in this nation? Absolutely not. That is your answer to if America is racist or not. Can America be better? Absolutely. But she's far from it. And until reparations are paid to these group of people who built this country, America will continually be racist. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, now let's move along to the politics section of the debate. Joe Biden stated weeks ago that our own intelligence agencies have determined that domestic terrorism rooted in white supremacy is the greatest terrorist threat to our own homeland, homeland today. Biden has spoken often about the rising threat of white supremacy and the dangers this poses to black Americans, but never actually explains what this white supremacist threat is or what it looks like. What is Biden talking about when he references domestic terrorism rooted in white supremacy? Uh, right side, panelist one, you have two minutes. I, th I think Biden is talking about anybody who votes for Trump, you know. <laughs> When he says that, that's what he actually means. And I think sometimes Biden is understood, misunderstood. It's kind of hard to understand. Salah, blah, 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 or uh, hairy legs and cockroaches and corn pop. You know, none of us have a problem with Biden actually calling out racism or white supremacy. But I do have a problem with the notion that anyone who votes for Trump is racist and only racists vote for Trump. And I think that's exactly what he he's saying, and none of us actually believe that Biden cares about black people. We just really think that what he's doing is putting out this call. He's saying this foolishness. He's not our friend. He's not Uncle Joe, unless he's that uncle that molests you when your mama steps out and goes to the grocery store. So what he's doing is just saying foolishness. He's trying to invoke fear in black people, and it's see-through. And we see right through it. That's what he means. Can a team member piggyback on somebody's time if time is left? Uh, I, I don't know. Can we do that? Can we use up some? I don't you know. Can do it go ahead. Yeah, you can do it. Go ahead. You are a black woman. You can do it. Sure. All right. You know what? Go for it. Sure. So um, thank you for that, Shamika. Um, I, I'm actually not sure what the president's talking about when he refers to domestic terrorism rooted in white supremacy. I find it odd that um, when, when this line is trotted out, and they tie it to threats to black communities, that's when the left says, we need to marshal all the resources of the federal government. We need to get the FBI, the DOJ, everybody to investigate. 
But when a street crime in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Cleveland, New York, Philadelphia, where 90 plus percent of the victims are particularly young black males, then what they, what they say is defund the police. I don't need to read reports about the young black men that get killed in our cities because I see it every day. So when you tell me the biggest threat to my life is some domestic terrorist, I grew up in New York, I went to school in Pittsburgh, I live right outside of DC, I have never met one of these people, That's so fine. I don't know what he's talking about. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, left side, panelist one, you have two minutes. When Biden talks about domestic terrorism being rooted in white supremacy, what he's saying is, is that it just dawned on him what we've been knowing for the last couple hundreds of years. The people that have, I don't know, shown up in hoods and decided to uh, take a man's life because he purchased property and he was thriving and successful. The people who went into Tulsa, Oklahoma and burned it down because they were successful and they had created communities with their own banks, with their own schools, with their own everything that they needed and were self-sufficient and financially stable. The people who have done those things, the people who went and lynched black men and hung them from trees and then stood in a crowd and took pictures with the body hanging from those trees, those people are the people that Joe Biden is just finding out are a part of this domestic problem issue. But strangely enough, that, that group has never been declared a national terroristic threat. Surprisingly, for some reason, it's just becoming a, a problem now that people like Gretchen Whitmer, a governor of Michigan, or Nancy Pelosi are being threatened with being lynched, something that people who look like me have been threatened with for over hundreds of years. So now that Joe is awake and aware of what the rest of us have been knowing for a very long time, that there is a problem with the hatred and the anger in this country that needs to be dealt with and protected against. It's actually the reason why uh, in the reparations bill that was created back in 1856 that they said not only are, we're, are we going to give land from the people who uh, joined the Confederacy and abandoned their property, we're going to give this land to the freedmen, but we're also going to make sure that our government, the military, goes in and protects those people for three years. Why? Because they already knew what type of hatred and white terrorists, white supremacy existed in our country. They knew they would need to protect the people who were trying to establish their life and be a part of the citizenship of America. That's time. Thank you. All right. Uh, right side, panelist three, you have 30 seconds. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Panelist two. Panelist two. Panelist two. Okay. You, we have a right. minute. We have a you're minute. right. <laughs> okay, go for it. Okay. So um, it, it's interesting that, that Reese's argument goes to uh, lynching and cross burning, which egregious crimes. We, we all agree with that. That can't be the, the, the biggest threat today. Those people are dead. So I reject the notion, again, that the people who are causing issues that, that make it so that homicide is the leading cause of death for young black men are, are night riders and, and grand wizards. That, that plays to your emotions. I'm, I'm going to talk more about this. That's part of the Selma syndrome that the left uses. They mix our ugly racial history with, with um, elements of Stockholm syndrome to make black people think that our fortunes are tied to, to their political power. But again, if you roll through West Baltimore or South Philly or South Side of Chicago, you are not, unless Jussie is talking, you're not going to see uh, uh, white supremacists terrorizing black communities. So again, that, that sounds good, that plays to your emotions, but we all know that that's not real. All right, thank you. Well, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, left side, you have one minute. Well, I, I find it interesting that for some reason we have to pretend history started like on Wednesday in order for the right side of the aisle's argument to make sense. We have to ignore everything from 1619 until 2020. We have to pretend everything started on Wednesday. Uh, in reality, when we're talking about this issue of white supremacist terrorists, we're talking about the Oklahoma City bombing. We're talking about Ruby Ridge. We're talking about the Charleston Nine. We're talking about the Buffalo shooting where we had 14 African Americans this year be killed by white supremacists. We're talking about a form of organized crime which is specifically instituted to uphold a system of white supremacy, uh, to uphold a system of white terror. The lynchings that Reese Everson talked about are the reason that you, uh, people in uh, Chicago have Mississippi accents because they were driven out of the South by those lynchings, taken and dispossessed from their land. So you cannot separate the history of America from the current America. You can, just as much as you cannot separate the roots of the tree from the fruit of the tree. 
Okay, thank and you And if very I much. can have his last five okay. seconds, the only thing that happened was that the people that were wearing the robes took them off and be put on police Nine. uniforms, and there are judges, our lawyers, and our doctors. Thank you. All right. I'm give me five seconds. <laughs> I just want to remind our panelists, you can use your time to engage and ask questions with the other side if you so choose. Uh, and, and can they respond back during our time? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right side, panelist three, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, so to Reese's point, um, the fact is, is that many, I'm sure, of you voted for Joe Biden. So the idea that there are laws, sure, there are laws that discriminate against black people. We know that from the 94 crime bill. No, the white domestic terrorism is not a threat to black, it's not the greatest threat, if a threat at all, to black people. And I think we need to start having open and honest conversations about what's really happening. And Delano actually alluded to a number of those, Time. where it's really about what's happening on our streets. White domestic terrorism is not our greatest threat. Panelist uh, three for the left side, you got 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, terrorism comes in many forms. In my community, it comes in the form of discrimination in housing, discrimination in banking, discrimination on the jobs. We've all seen videos of black people being mistreated on their job, trying to deliver packages, whatever the case that may be, getting called an N-word trying to deliver those packages. We know the reports of Will Fargo purposely denying black people business loans. If you don't call that domestic terrorism, what do you call that? It damn sure ain't freedom. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so uh, the next question for under politics. Analysis of the 2020 election shows that Trump gained in popularity with nearly every minority community. Around 5% more black men voted for Trump in 2020 than in 2016. And around 4% more black women voted for Trump in 2020. After four years of being labeled a racist, a bigot, a white supremacist, nonstop by the liberal media, what explains Donald Trump rise in popularity with black Americans, and should Trump run again? Right side, panelist one, you have two minutes. Uh, so, um, should Donald Trump run again? I do think he's a wartime president, and I think we're in a war, good versus evil. So that's why I would support him running again. I would also be open to Ron DeSantis because I think that he also understands that we're in a war, good versus evil. I know for sure I don't want a beta male pissing on himself in office. So, you know, when it comes to the rise in popularity, I think it's because of common sense and people being able to just be logical. Right now, no one is concerned about having a friend, somebody that likes them, or cares about them. We're more concerned with putting gas in our cars and food on our table, feeding our children and having a place to stay. We have hit an inflation of 40-year high. And so right now, people are less concerned about somebody being nice or being friendly to them. And I think that when it comes to, you know, the, the charge, the black men are leading that charge. Black men are changing the numbers. Why? Because black men are least likely to be given a crutch when times get hard. And right now we're in hard times. If you look back over history, when a, a black woman can't feed her child, she gets a check from the government. When a black man can't feed his child, he goes to jail. So mm -hmm. for right now, we're not really concerned about whether somebody likes us. Black men have started to step and be more logical, and they're going to save the country because that's what it's about right now. That's why the numbers are changing. All right. Thank you, Shamika. Uh, now back to the left side. Panelist one, you have two minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll hop in. Uh, I actually agree with much of what the previous interlocutor said. I uh, think that we look at the numbers in 2020, uh, Donald Trump became known as the president of socialism. He became the president of sent out $1,400 stimmy checks. He became the, social, uh, the president of PPP loans. He became the president of unlimited tax cuts with no uh, budget cuts there long. Uh, funny fact, uh, and when Donald Trump walked into office in 2019, or in uh, 2016, the National 
national debt was about $19 trillion. When he walked out in 2021, uh, the national debt was $28 trillion. You had $10 trillion of debt created under Donald Trump, and much of that was, spent, was given in tax cuts to the 1%, but also much of that became a part of this cultural zeitgeist and what the Republicans call the dependency culture uh, that they profit there, uh, thereafter. Even when you talk about the gain today Donald Trump had in those groups, you're still talking about 95% of black women voted against him. 90 US percent of black men voted against him. I think that we have to take these things away from the concept to personalize politics and more towards or, uh, more so towards an agenda that will help the African American community. Uh, while my question often, I'll pose this in the time we have to the panel, uh, what exactly is the Republican agenda when it comes to fixing many of the issues that uh, happen in the black community? Because we talk much about the problems, but very little about the solutions that are based in actual policy. Much of it is based in social science, very little is based in political science. Anyone want to respond to that? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so I can actually jump in here. Well, we do know what the policies are. Um, then we talk about police reform. Well, the GOP police reform bill, Jim, Democrats filibustered that bill in 2020. I believe it was in June 2020 over the issue of qualified immunity. We can actually debate qualified immunity, but that particular GOP police reform bill, Democrats, Democrats and Republicans agreed almost about on 90% of the bill. The issue of qualified immunity killed it in Democrats, not Republicans, Democrats were prevented it from being coming to the floor for a vote. And in fact, there was an amendment called the Breonna Time. Taylor Act introduced by Rand Paul that Democrats will not support. Those are things gotcha. that the Republican Party can do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, now it's back to you guys. Panelists too, you have one minute. Oh, yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, I, I'll, I'll actually finish that point. But I think what we, what we need to understand when we have the discussion of what one party does for the black community versus you know, another party is that almost all of the things that impact us happen at a local level. The federal government, we kind of look at the federal government and say, look at Big Daddy. This is what Big Daddy does. No. Mm -hmm. So those, those chokehold bans that you may want, that happens at your local level. We know because there are places all around the country, localities that ban chokeholds. We know these things as far as no-knock warrants, which is why I brought up the um, Rand Paul amendment, because it was called the Breonna Taylor Act, and it would have effectively banned no-knock warrants, not just in drug cases, which is what the Democrats' proposals was. It would have actually eliminated, effectively, no-knock warrants across the board. We can have these type of conversations, but when we go in with the assumption that this side isn't doing this or this side isn't doing that, the fact is, as I said, Local politics matter. Time. That's that's where your taxes, your affordable housing, that's where all of that actually comes from. Okay. All right, left side, panelists two, you have one minute. Hey guys. <laughs> all right. So Donald Trump popularity went up uh, with black Americans, and it's pretty high with people that are not black. Why is that? Well, we got something here called the lowest white American. Donald Trump was able to figure out something that a lot of the establishment Democrats or Republicans didn't want him to know that there is a group in America who've been left behind. Their jobs have dried up. The big three has closed uh, Chrysler, Ford, GM, and they are left in middle America trying to figure it out. Their jobs aren't there. The economy's not there, and they don't get where they're supposed to be because they don't understand why they're not doing better than all of these black people that they're looking at. Well, so when he became their savior, then the other people realized, well, wait a minute. How do we try to, we want to catch up because people are ahead of us. Well, black men have realized that if they stop paying attention to what the Democrats are saying, they can try to catch on to what jo Donald Trump is offering and maybe Time. they'll benefit as well. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> right side, panelist three, you have 30 seconds. So I'm, I'm going to try to hit a couple of things in 30 seconds. Um, directly responding to Robert's question, first I'll say this, it's a lot easier to, for politicians to mess up your life than it is to fix any of your problems. Two years of COVID should have, should have proven that. But in terms of policies, the, the right tends to support school choice. You have states like Arizona that are moving towards education savings accounts. In places like New York City, the government is antagonistic towards charters and vouchers. Um, people talk about criminal justice reform, which is fine. Look up Operation Legend and, and what Time. the Trump administration did to address crime, violent crime in some of our cities. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Left side, you got 30 seconds. Going back to it. Um, 
You know, that's, that's a great question. Because when you think about the tradition of, of black people in America, usually uh, it tends to lean more to the left. But what uh, black Americans are understanding is that the left needs to do more. They have not done enough. And saying to black people, uh, you're not black if you don't vote for me, does not appeal to us at all. It might appeal to uh, entertainers and, 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 and uh, you know, YouTubers, but to the core of black people, that does not mean something. So we need Democrats to do more if they want our vote. Time. Okay, let's move on to our next question. I need 30 seconds. Republicans have been pushing increasingly for voter ID laws, as well as laws to prevent the usage of drop boxes and mail-in voting. These measures have been labeled as racist by many in the Democrat Party and liberal media, with many people, including President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, calling these laws Jim Crow 2.0. Why are voter ID laws considered racist, and what are specific ways black voters are being suppressed? Right side, panelist one, you have two minutes. Why are voter ID laws considered racist? I think because the Democratic Party has been very successful in weaponizing race in that way. So I call it the for-profit race hustling industry. What do we know about voter ID laws? In 2005, when the state of Georgia implemented an in-person, I'm sorry, yeah, an in-person voter ID law, that until this day, has actually not been overturned. What we also know about voter ID laws, an Obama-appointed judge, his name is Chief Judge Mark Walker, out of Florida, in response to the NAACP and the Civil Rights Organization lawsuit against the state of Florida, specifically around not their in-person voter ID requirement, it was actually a requirement to show an ID to request an absentee ballot. What did that judge say in the state of Florida, the Obama appointed judge in the state of Florida? He said that unfortunately for the plaintiffs who were the NAACP and other organizations, they could not find a single person who was able to testify and say that they were not able to get a voter ID. So we do know that <laughs> black people are able to get um, voter IDs and he, wrote, he threw that part of the case out. Now why do I bring this up? Because this is an Obama appointed judge said that this voter ID law thing that you guys, this case that you have, I'm going to throw that out. And he also said because there are specific things in the voter ID, in the election law that they passed where even if you didn't have a voter ID, you could cast a provisional ballot. If you needed to use the last four of your social security number, a state ID number, if you needed to actually use a utility bill. These are all forms of um, voter ID identification that you can use in order to vote. So no, according to at least an Obama appointed judge, there is no constitutional issue with um, voter ID. Now, this isn't me just saying this as a partisan or a Republican, I'm referring to the actual law. So no, voter ID laws, according to judges all around this country, they're not racist. Left side, panelist two, uh, panelist, panelist one, you have two minutes. Uh, so piggybacking on Malik's point uh, about that Georgia voter ID law in 2005. So in 2004, John Kerry almost won the state of Georgia. Very, very close race. 2005, you passed a voter ID law, which actually did go up to the circuit court and was overturned as a poll tax because it charged individuals a fee to get a state-issued uh, Georgia voter ID. And so that was overturned and the legislature had to reform that bill. 2021. You had not had a Democrat or African American elected statewide since Thurbert Baker in 2009. You had had 12 years of unanimous Republican rule in the state as a result of that voter ID law, which was declared a poll tax and reformed. Uh, you had had over a decade of complete Republican rule of the state, a constitutional majority in the Senate, a constitutional majority in the House. Every single statewide elected official was a white Republican male in the state as a result of that 2006 law. Um, because of efforts by voting groups, including ones that I led, um, that changed in 2020, where Democrats won the state of Georgia. 2021, amazingly, 
they passed a new voter uh, law, the SB202, uh, which was meant to change the voting laws to make sure they could still maintain that power. If, they, if the, you're not creating these laws to suppress votes, why does it only seem that they change voting laws when Democrats start winning? Uh, as most deaf ones say, you start keeping pace, they start switching up the tempo. And that's what we're seeing in many of these states around the country, that they are these, uh, the North Carolina judge also said, uh, with in the gerrymandering contest, that these things are created and laser focused uh, in order to disenfranchise certain groups of people in the United States of America. When you look at the demographics, Georgia right now, the state is 35% African American, 20% Latino, 12% Asian American, 52% women, and Atlanta's one of the biggest LGBTQ capitals in the United States of America, but yet and still, Joe Biden won that state by 12,000 votes. We cannot deny the impact of voter suppression when it comes to the demographical results that we see in many elections. And for that reason, I don't think we can ignore the fact that Republican states try to pass voter suppression laws so they can maintain power with regards to the demographics of the state. Thank you very much. All right, right side, panelists two, you have one minute. Oh. So the, the notion that voter ID laws are racist, I think, is well-worn. I mean, you hear it every election cycle. I think if the left actually believed it, what they would do is say, we're going to uh, create a, a voter ID drive. We're going to get all the, the old ladies. We're going to take them from church and, and, and help them sign up for IDs. That's not the case. What they do, as I said, I mentioned this, the Selma syndrome, the left loves to use um, America's real and ugly racial history to make black people think that America in 2022 is no different than 1922. You can, you can even hear it in some of my colleagues, right? It, it's always, well, look what happened back in the 1800s. Uh, understood, but we're, we're in today right now. So um, I don't know any person, old or young, who does not have an ID. My mother-in-law grew up in the segregated South. She's over 80, I'm not gonna tell her age. She has an ID, all her sisters have IDs. All of the people on this stage have IDs. I know they do. All their friends have IDs because you couldn't get your, your Bellinis at brunch on Sunday if you did not have a, an ID. So the notion that Time. black folk don't have IDs, as I said, is patently ridiculous. Left side, panelist two, you have one minute. It's extremely uh, elitist of us to presume that people don't have the ability to get an ID when we know for a fact that there were people who couldn't get out of the way of Hurricane Ira that just hit because they didn't have transportation. There are people who have been for the last 20, 30 years unable to get out of the way of hurricanes and were stuck in the path of it because they didn't have transportation. So if they don't have transportation to get out of the eye of a storm, how do you expect them to have transportation to get an ID? But that's number one. Why? ID is just another form of poll tax, as Robert said, as the literacy test of old that were used to prevent uh, blacks from voting, gerrymandering. All of these are tools that the Supreme Court has said are tools used to prevent African Americans from voting. Then there's the, um, the visitor, I'm sorry, then let me tell you, I was a voter protection attorney back in Michigan in 2008 when Obama was running for office. People from Macomb County that were white were coming to Detroit telling people that they weren't eligible to vote. Then you have robocallers Time. like Republicans who are actually on trial right now for calling and telling black people, if you use your ID to vote, Time. they're going to come after you for child support. They're going to come after you for old warrants. Time. These are robocalls. Uh, Jack Berkman. Time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, right side, panelists three, you have 30 seconds. Well, I was going to say the idea that we can't get voter ID is just a distraction, but apparently I need to be afraid of the ghost of slavery past because that's where the, the left likes to live. Um, you know, when it comes to voter suppression, I do think that gerrymandering is an issue. However, what's also an issue when it comes to voter suppression is uh, non-citizens being able to vote. I think it's also lying politicians stoking fear and telling lies and getting black people to believe that they can't get out and vote. So I think there is some voter suppression, but I don't think it's where people say that it is. Left side, panelist three, you have 30 seconds. Yes, thank you. Um, suppressing the black vote is as American as apple pie. That has always been the case. Um, whether you're talking about voter ID, uh, gerrymandering, uh, any type of thing to keep black people down, white supremacy has done that consistently. 
And they want to suppress the black vote because they want to suppress the individual. It's all connected. There's right. not one without the other. There's not. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, let's move on to culture. According to the Census Bureau in 1960, the number of African-American children who lived in single-parent homes was around 22%. Today, that number has risen to a staggering 64%. What is the explanation for this phenomenon, and what effect has this extraordinarily high rate of black children being raised in single-parent homes had on the black community as a whole? And does the black community need strong, intact nuclear families to be successful. Right side, panelist one, you have two minutes. Sure, um, I'm gonna answer the last question first. Yes, the black community needs strong, intact nuclear families to be successful, point blank, period. Because everything starts in the home. The, everything. Um, the, the, the notion that the government is a, is a suitable substitute for a father has been disproven by the last 60 years of uh, America's social history. In fact, I, I always argue that the federal government is an unfaithful husband and an absent father because it just has too many households to support of, of every color, of every color. So the explanation is a number of things. It's complex like most, most social phenomena are. Some of them have to do with economics. Some of it has to do with policy. If you create incentives for single women to be able to, in effect, marry the government, then what you do is incentivize sing single parenthood. Um, some of it has to do with culture. When I say culture, I'm talking about norms, beliefs, behaviors. And wh when these things start to roll downhill, you don't have to keep pushing it. After a certain point, they, they repeat themselves um, on their, on, under their own power. So, so when you see now seven out of 10 black children born to parents that are, that are unmarried, it's not because of the invisible hand of government that's pushing it. That's just become a norm. We don't, we don't shame people, um, specifically in the black community, we don't shame men for having children that they don't take care of. We don't. We shame men for having political views that we don't agree with. But if, if, if a guy like Future or, or whoever else, I mean, rapper or regular guy, has seven kids by six different women, nobody bats, bats an eyelash. So one of the big problems about this particular phenomenon is that the left and its professors and preachers and politicians refuse to talk about the importance of marriage and family. The last person who did it was President Obama. He was consistently criticized by his left flank, including uh, uh, hosts on MSNBC and, and, and college I'm professors. Thank you. Left side. Panelist one, you have two minutes. Glad you brought up President Obama. He's one of the people I was going to mention. Why? Because the single family home has created some of the most iconic people of the 21st century. Your President Obama was one of them. Your, your President Bill Clinton was also another one. What does that mean? That means that you can take a, a woman and who has a village and allow her to then build and create an incredible human being. That doesn't mean that every person coming out of a two-parent household is this wonderful, on-track, on-par person. I mean, have you seen the, the, the Bush children? I mean, there's so many examples of children who were raised in two-parent family homes who have gone up inside shoot schools and shot them up. The point I'm making is, is that it's about community and building and making sure that there's someone surrounding that mother and surrounding those parents, whether it's a single father or single mother, so that they can have the resources and tools that they need. It's not individual to one person. If a home is filled with abuse and neglect, you're still going to get a broken person. So to put that on and say, well, yes, clearly there could be some things that we rebuild in the black community and love and family and relationships are one of those but that's one of the psychological chains of slavery that's the vestige of slavery what what needs to happen is is that if we build rebuild the family rebuild the black person pay reparations i'm sure many people can get the therapy that they need to have healthy relationships and healthy homes but what we've not done is we've not put 
American, the freedmen, the people who in 1856 were supposed to receive something from the government to help them engage as um, American citizens and give them the step forward to take them from slavery to citizenship, that has not been paid. And so you have a group of people who have still not been put in position of equality in this country. And until that's done, you're going to have to continue looking at, hey, why is it that their, their community's not catching up to us? They were never repatriated. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, right side, panelists too, you have one minute. Um, so, yes, I think that the black community does actually need strong nuclear families, but not because we're black, but because that's the natural order. Amen. And so I think it would be safe to say that Reese may not be a Christian because when God looked at man, he said it's not good for man to be alone. He gave him a woman. He Amen. didn't give him a village. He didn't give him the community. He said, be fruitful and multiply to this man and this woman. So it's supposed to be God husband, wife, child. And that's the natural order. And that's why I think we can see some of the foolishness that we see in the black community because we are out of order. And we can make up all of this stuff that sounds good. I'm from a single parent home and I'm not somewhere cracked out in the street selling my body. However, that is not ideal. It would have been better for me to be in God's order to have a mother and a father to raise me. And that's just what it is. You know, the effect that it's had, we've had women for generations generations now saying that they don't need a man and we have boys that don't want to be one. Bars. Bars. <laughs> okay. Bars. Left side, panelist two, you have one minute. Uh, I'll, I'll hop on this one. It, it's interesting to me that, one, this should not be a partisan issue because, again, I'm from Georgia, so uh, I think I bump into one of Herschel Walker's kids every time I leave the house. Or, you know, or Donald Trump got five kids by three different women, and that's fine. So it's not a partisan issue. Uh, on this conceptualization of the nuclear family being ideal, uh, I, I was raised in a very Christian household where that was presented to me. But at the same time, Abraham didn't live that life. Moses didn't live that life. Uh, many of the patri uh, patriarchs in the Bible did not live that life. So when we talk about it taking a village, it's about making sure more so that as a governmental entity in this country, we provide for every citizen to ensure they have the access to education, the access to housing, access to safe food and safe water, access to clothing. I'm less worried about who is and who is not transgender than I am by, ma uh, by making sure that we can determine that every single individual has the constitutional rights guaranteed to them and can share in the fruits of this nation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> On the dock. All right. Uh, right side, panelist three, you have 30 seconds. Um, our uh, nuclear families, whether you call it a nuclear family, whether you call it a two-parent household, what we do know from psychologists and everybody is that it having a two loving parents in a household is the most helpful environment for any child to be raised. That does not mean that it is the same across the board. I grew up in a single family household. So look, look and look at where I am. So it's not an either or sort of proposition. Yes, it is very important for any child, black or otherwise, to grow up in a home with two Time. loving parents. Amen. Left side, panelist three, 30 seconds. Thank you. You know, it's amazing to me that people ask black people the normal questions that they would never ask any other group of people. No one asks uh, European Jewish people, is it ideal to have a two-parent household? No one asks Asian people, is it ideal? Everyone knows that it is, it is an ideal thing to have a strong father and a loving mother in a household. Now let's talk about who's worked so hard to destroy that. White supremacy implemented slave breeding Time. farms and I should say uh, creating the effect of one out of three black men will go into prison. Time. And I should also say the black man leaving the house in the system of welfare, none of that was created by freedmen, Time. that was created by white supremacy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, reminder again, using your time, you can engage and ask questions to the other side if you want. 
All right, so let's move on to the topic of education. What is critical race theory, and is it being taught in Americans' schools, America's schools today? Uh, right side, panelist one, you have two minutes. Um, critical race theory, um, I think, is actually the entire discussion of critical race theory is a distraction when we're talking about our education system. Um, it is, it's become popular. We know what made it become popular was that pamphlet that the Smithsonian, the, Afri the National Museum of African American History, and probably got it wrong, when they released that pamphlet talking about assumptions of white culture. What were those assumptions of white culture? White people, not black people, white people were timely. White, white people respected authority. Donald Trump responded to that. He started criticizing that. That wasn't actually critical race theory. That was a version of what we call anti-racist training. Anti-racist training in our education system is the issue. If you look at charter schools, like I can't think of the, uh, the um, Pickett um, Charter School in North Philly, they have an anti-racist training model where they're teaching their kids, they're teaching their kids in order to frame discussions, whether it's literature or otherwise, to put themselves in the shoes of someone of color. Do our kids need that type of education? I say no. On the subject of critical race theory, I studied critical race theory in college. It wasn't in law school. I studied in undergraduate school. I think it is one of many theories that are out there, such as post-structuralism, um, feminist theory, all of these things have their place in an academic setting. I don't believe that critical race theory, for the most part, is being taught in schools, but the anti-racist training, which means that a five-year-old kid, these are things that are happening that I'm not making up, that kids have to sign anti-racist um, anti pledges. Seven-year-old families have to sign anti-racist pledges. That is the issue, and I think that, unfortunately, critical race theory has become kind of the boogeyman, but it's not the real issue. That anti-racist training, which is an, a subset of diversity, equity, and inclusion training, the facilitators of those type of programs are the problem, not necessarily the theory itself. Thank you. Left side, panelist one, you have two minutes. I'll, I'll hop on, then I'll reserve some time if, uh, if needed. Uh, so to Malik's point, no, critical race theory is not taught in any school, well, K through 12 school in the United States of America. It's a complete fantasy made up by white right wing media when they found something that sounded scary to white folks. Uh, a few years ago, the question was, Common Core is going to uh, kill everybody. Then before that, we have to have prayer in school back in the 90s. And then before that, it was, should we spank kids or not? It's always a new culture war issue that they developed. So they don't have to address the actual structural issues when it comes to education and the problems there in this country. I wish the right would pay mu as much attention to the school bus driver shortage in America as they do to critical race theory. I wish they would pay attention to the uh, lack of academic facilities in many places in this country as they do to, uh, to critical race theory. I wish, quite frankly, they would pay attention to the digital divide, which affects rural white communities more so than anyone else. Lack of access to high-speed internet, which is crippling portions of our country when it comes to education, but they, that conversation's been hijacked by critical race theory. So let's look at what happens when districts and states decide they're going to fight back, quote unquote, against critical race theory. Ron DeSantis and his anti-woke agenda uh, in the state of Florida. 2019, when he uh, entered office, uh, Florida was top 10 in the nation when it comes to education. Since he has launched his anti-woke agenda, quote unquote, banning 54 uh, math books because they contain, contain what he calls critical race theory, Glade County, Florida's math test scores have dropped by 24 points. If you look at Jefferson in County, Florida. Reading scores have dropped 17 points in that period of time. Florida has gone from a top 10 state to, uh, to a far lower tier. I think they're 25 right now when it comes to educational metrics. So I want people to start concentrating not so much on what is the scary boogeyman subject this time that we need to run down to the school board for. Start concentrating on which of these books teach kids math the best. Which of these books teach, teaches kids how to read the best? Is there any uh, actual information on, on, uh, uh, on the record or any study done that says that teaching critical race theory or anti-racist training drops test scores? Or is there anything that says that the inclusion of diversity and equity and inclusion in uh, curriculums actually um, negatively impacts the children? Until I see that, then this is all just a facade. Okay. Right side, panelists two, you have one minute. So, um, I'm going to use 10 seconds in my one minute to go back to the previous question, which is on family. And one of the things that I find strange is that the left has a habit of practicing things that they don't preach. Because if I asked 
Robert and Reese to hold up their left hand, you're going to see a ring on there. So if marriage was not important, middle class people, including middle class black folk, would not do it. Another thing, they don't run the Who's Your Daddy DNA truck around Martha's Vineyard. So, so the people who, who have jobs and are in the elite, they, they have a particular way of ordering their lives, and marriage and the nuclear family is part of that. That being said, I do not think that critical race theory is taught in schools, per se. I wouldn't mind if it was taught as a theory. What you get is critical race applied principles, or crap, which I call it, because <laughs> I am not interested in any teacher teaching my child that their skin color has anything to do with their ability to succeed in this country. That's one of the reasons. That, that's one of the reasons my wife and I homeschool, because I'm not interested in A is, act, uh, a is for activists for my kids. We, we, we're not doing that in the, in the Squire's household. Left side, panelist two, you have one minute. So, <laughs> critical race theory, uh, Malik learned it in college. Most of us actually only introduce, are introduced to it in law school because that's where it's generally taught, um, unless you're studying political science or something like that. But what is the problem? The problem is, is that in this country, there's been a history of, oh, I don't know, hanging black men from trees and all this horrible stuff that's happened. And so we get to the point where, you know, at one point, people would go to these lynchings and stand next to the body and take the, bring their children and take pictures. There's postcards. They would take a little snip of the burned body so that they could commemorate, so they could say, oh, look, we lynched somebody today. And so it used to be something people were proud of. Now you fast forward to 2022, and it's something people are ashamed of because we realize that that was inhumane. We realize that that was barbaric. We realize that that is an ugly part of our history that we need to be ashamed of. But here's the problem. We've got little boys and girls now and their grandmothers and grandfathers are like, we don't want people to know that when five and six year old and seven year olds were trying to integrate schools, that we were throwing things at them and calling them names. We don't want them to know our ugly, Time. sordid history. So it's not critical race uh, theory that's being taught. It's American history, people. Right side, panelists three, you got 30 seconds. I see white slave masters. That's what I feel like I need to, to say, you know. Uh, so no, I don't think critical race theory is being taught in schools either. But what I do think we should focus on is what is actually being taught in schools. We know that looking uh, at everything through a racial lens is not good. Teaching white kids that they are inherently evil is not good. Teaching black kids that they are oppressed simply because of their skin color is not good. Teaching someone how to masturbate at five years old Time. is not good. So that's what we need to be focused on, what's actually being taught. And some of those things are not acceptable. Panelist three, 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, critical race theory, like anything else, this is uh, white America not wanting to look into the mirror at her sins. Uh, we can't wait for white people to get to college to learn about racism. It's already too late. The problem is we have, and what we're about to see in the, the next holiday, there's still black, uh, white children dressing up in blackface. They don't understand the history of blackface. Uh, are you surprised? You, you, never, you don't know these stories? I can send them to you after I'm... the show. <laughs> All right. Next question. Black Democrats support targeted school choice vouchers by 70%, while white Democrats support by only 46%. What explains the discrepancy, and does this impact black students? Right side, panelist one, you have two minutes. What explains the discrepancy? Two words, teachers' unions. National Education Association. Um, what, funny thing, and, and I'm, I'm going to tell you all a real story. We're in Washington, D.C. Um, I've lived in this area for 15 years. D.C. has the only federally funded voucher program in the country. It's called the Opportunity Scholarship. When President Obama came into office in 2008, him and the Democrats tried to kill it. Now, he didn't send his daughters to uh, D.C. public schools, and he wanted to prevent low-income black uh, families from sending their kids to, to private schools. Fast forward, Trump administration puts more money into it. Here comes the Biden administration. Again, they want to kill it. They zeroed it out in their budget proposal for 2023. So one of the reasons why is because the, the, the Democratic Party serves teachers' unions. 
not students. Because if they did, and this is actually one of the areas in which you could argue, this, this could, you could say that this is systemically racist because, again, when you look at voucher programs in large urban areas, vouchers, charter schools, those are primarily used by, by black families. What the left will do is say, oh, charter schools reinstitute segregation. You know why they do that? Because the very people that say that they're pro-black think that any institution that's majority black is inherently segregated and inferior. I reject that. The notion, I, I reject the notion that black students need white classmates in order to learn. Full stop. Full stop. So, so they, um, the, the party, again, is antagonistic towards school choice, and you can see this in, in most of the big cities, because they are supported by the unions. They do not serve the parents. It's, it's the same reason, and, and hopefully we'll get into this, that you know what, I'm going to save that for right now. Let me stay on school choice. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that, that's, that's really the discrepancy. And, and just, just watch it. Listen to the difference in what parents say that they want and the party says that they're going to do. And they're aided and abetted by all of the majority black institutions, NAACP and all the black media. All right, left side, panelist one, you have two minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a, a very good reason that you see this uh, difference. One is the question of individual uh, advancement versus community advancement. If you ask me the question, what is best for my child and do I want to do that right now? Yes, I'm going to pick doing what's best for my child right now. But when it comes to a wholesale change in fixing the issues uh, happening within communities that have happened for generations, you're not going to save black children one child at a time with uh, voucher programs and scholarship programs to charter schools uh, and to parochial schools. You have to have a wholesale change in the way that we treat our public education system in this country. And you have to have the concomitant funding along with that. America has a defense budget uh, that would put the, we could invade the rest of the world right now and be okay and still have missiles left over. Why do not we not put that money into our educational system to ensure that we are educating our children to be competitive with children in on, on Mumbai right now, to be competitive with children in Lagos, to be competitive with children around the globe? Is because we are recalcitrant when it comes to addressing real issues, uh, issues associated with education, and we often have Band-Aid solutions, uh, such as voucher programs and charter schools. Busing a child an hour away to a school just for them to get an education is not as effective as ensuring that you are building up these schools within their district that you are actually paying teachers a living and fair wage. There's no reason that, a te uh, that all the teachers in the country make less money than an NBA player right now. If you look at the $200 million contracts that some players have, you can take every teacher in the country and they don't make that kind of money. There's no reason that we should be behind in technology uh, in this nation, but we do not uh, fully fund and uh, focus on that. And when you have this, uh, this diminution of public schools around the country, then 90% of the children will not be able to access those scholarships. 90% of the children will not be able to be bused to those new institutions. You have to look at what will build up the entirety of the community, not select people who have the opportunity, as the Obama kids has, as was mentioned, uh, to go to those private charter and parochial schools. You need to ensure that you're building up these systems in the totality, because this next generation won't be led by the 10% that go to these schools. They'll be led by the 90% who don't have access to that. Mm, so only the rich people get to go to private schools. Okay. Right side, panelists too, you have one minute. Yeah, so um, the, peak, the, the beauty of that program, the Opportunity Scholarship Program, that it was actually started by a Republican, George um, W. Bush, I believe, in either 2003 or 2004. The intent of the program was to target about 2,000 students. To Robert's point about what the, the country spends money on, we know right now that we have about a $30 trillion debt. But what are we doing in this country? We're sending billions to Ukraine. The $17 million that has been allocated, the $17 million that has been allocated for the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program is a drop in the bucket of that $30 trillion debt. So I agree with Robert. I'm sure many of us on this panel can agree that the government needs to start, if we're going to send billions, and I think at this point we're probably almost close to $60 billion that we've sent to Ukraine, and more will be coming. We can invest that money into our education system so that it is part of a, um, a, a network. It's not just either or. Time. We can have charter schools, we can have public schools, we can have private schools. All of these things matter. Left side, panelists two, one minute. 
The whole point of integration was so that little black girls and little uh, black boys could go to school and have access to things that were equal to that of whites. Okay, so that was 60 years ago. Where's our progress report? Our progress report is today's classrooms are still overrun and underfunded. If you're from where I'm from, which is Detroit, you know that the uh, schools are funded by the taxes of the community. So a person who's in inner city Detroit does not have the same uh, classroom aesthetics as a classroom in West Bloomfield. Why? Because West Bloomfield, they have way more money in their budget for every single student. So then you have unequal. They're separate. I mean, they're, they might not be separate anymore, but they're still unequal. So the point is, is that we need to be able to give our children access to up-to-date books, up-to-date technology, and that's not what's going on. The problem I have with Donald Trump, and I'm going to take it back to a previous question, is that when he says he's going to make America great again, that's meaning that, okay, you're going to make we're going to take it back to putting, what, blacks on the plantation? Okay, well, fine. But that still does not put a black, par a, a black person on par with even the lowest white person in this country. Time. Unless Donald Trump is willing to give reparations to black people, they're still Time. not in a position to be on par. Thank you. Right side, panelist three, you have 30 seconds. You know, with some of the things Reese said in the beginning, I actually agree with, which is why I love uh, having that uh, school choice and charter schools. I think the reason why white Dems don't push it as much is because they lose their control over education. Mm -hmm. I also think because they have the money to send their kids to private schools. And so because this is the party that claims they're the, you know, hey, I got your back, black people, they give black people their ass to kiss so much by not even pushing this because because we know that black people actually utilize school choice Time. in greater numbers. Left side, panelist three, 30 seconds. Thank you. Yes. Um, black children and black parents are tired of the miseducation. Uh, we're tired of receiving the same, uh, oh, my white founding fathers who were slave masters were great people. We're not buying that anymore. So obviously, if something is been going on, you have to do something different. Uh, this is no different from the rise of black people going to the, the right side. They're tired of working this machine that just isn't working for them. Um, that's plainly as put. Black people are tired of the miseducation. All right. Our next subject is economics. According to a 2019 poll conducted by the Cato Institute, 62% of blacks prefer socialism to capitalism. However, studies show that blacks successfully utilized free market capitalism to get ahead prior to the 1960s. What do you believe has given a rise to a disfavorable view of capitalism among black Americans? Right side, panelist one, you have two minutes. Yeah, so I think part of the problem, part, well, not part of the problem, the biggest problem is, is that the Democratic Party has been very successful in um, kind of erasing um, the business ownership, um, entrepreneurship, um, opportunity. And so they fed this to the black community a lot. I don't think that there is an issue with um, blacks supporting capitalism versus socialism, because at the end of the day, when I'm talking to people out in the community, when I'm on different programs, I have white people reaching out to me that I'm sure that I don't always agree with, we talk about the issues that matter, and those issues are economic. So when Shamika was talking about those kitchen table issues, our issues are no different. Just like white people, Asian people, Jewish people, black people, whatever, we want opportunity, so we want business investment. We want lower taxes. Believe it or not, many of the things that we'll talk about on this stage tonight, once we go home and have our private conversations with each other on either side of the aisle, you will have agreement on many issues. We may play different in public. But in private, many people support. So if you are a business owner, it doesn't matter if you're a black business owner, a man or a woman or whatever, you want lower taxes. What did lower taxes do? Because those type of things matter. And to those point of lower taxes, this is when I was talking about that the things that happen at the local level affect us. That is what impacts our lives. So those affordable housing policies that you're upset about here in Washington, D.C. right now, um, HUD is actually, oh, the D.C. is on the verge of losing its federal contract because of its poor management of its um, housing here in D.C. That has nothing to do with the federal government. That is a local problem, and I want to continue to stress that it is local politics that 
matter. Black people want to be business owners. Black people are business owners. Black people are doctors and lawyers, and they want lower taxes. Not everybody wants to pay a whole lot of money in taxes. I think there are so many things that we agree on, but when we get on television, we kind of don't play Nine. nice with each other. But I think that we can find common ground on most of these things. Left side. Panelists, too. One minute. Okay, capitalism amongst black people, supposedly it's got a disfavorable view, and, and I find that as an asinine statement in the first place, because everything I know about black people have been hardworking, rebuilding since they were relieved from their shackles. If I take you back, we could go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where there was a place called Black Wall Street, where they had their own, as I said, bankers, businesses, own, built their own homes from the ground up. Why? Because they were skilled tradesmen and maces and plumbers and knew how to do everything Thing for themselves. Why? Because on the plantation, they were the workers, so they were the skilled trade, so they knew how to do everything and build a whole community by themselves. But guess what? Then there was another place that sits under the, um, 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 the park in New York, Central Park. As we speak right now, there's a whole community sitting under there. There was another place in Arlington, Virginia, called Freedman's Village. It was given to black people after they were released, and they built a whole community. Guess what? That was leveled, and a cemetery sits on it, and that's your Arlington National Cemetery right now. There was another place in Detroit that there was a community called Black Bottom and they built a freeway through it. So every time black people decide that they want to build something and be capitalists, somebody decides to come along and either burn it down, tear it down, level it, put a cemetery over it, or put New York, what's the name of the park in New York? Central Park. Central Park on top of it. Okay, so when you talk about black people don't like capitalists, that's bull crap. The problem is, and like Martin Luther King said in the other America, his speech back in 1960, why is it that when blacks were freed in 1830, they were supposed to receive 40 acres and a mule? The Homestead Act was supposed to give land to African Americans. Instead of doing that, they took, they said blacks were not eligible for the land, gave some land to the freedmen, took it back, and then also told black people, you know what, we're going to instead give this land to European immigrants. And that's how we filled up the West and the Midwest of the United States of America. That land was given, millions of acres of land were given Time. to white people coming in from Europe, immigrants that we weren't even allowed access to. Time. So before you talk to me about socialism, Tell me who's been given the socialist handout here in this country, and baby, it wasn't my people. All right. Right side, panelists, too. Now you have one minute. Um, I'm just glad that I don't know any of the black people that are oppressed and scared of white people, starting with my kid's father, who actually takes very good care of us, and he's an entrepreneur. So I'm thankful that, you know, he's not afraid of capitalism and what may happen to him, you know, like in times past. But anyway, um, so I think a lot of times when they have an unfavorable view, it's because they just don't understand the terms. You have a lot of people that think about somebody sharing their wealth with them, opposed to the wealth they accumulate sharing that with somebody else. I haven't seen one black person say to me, hey, I blinged out these sneakers, and you know, I went and I picked up the rhinestones, and I did all this hard work, and you know, I don't care about the profit. I want to give half of that to you. I, matter of fact, the people on this stage right now all wanted a check to be here. So I don't think that black people are against capitalism. I just think when you hear people talking about it, they don't understand the terms. They don't realize they got to give Time. what they make away as well. Well, I, I think black folks understand socialism versus capitalism very well. Whether you're talking about the economic theories of, on the right, they like Thomas Sowell. Uh, uh, people on the left may look at the writings of Franz Fanon. Uh, but at the end of the day, the question is always about capitalism in this community has been that we have socialized risk in America, but privatized gains. So I'll give you an example. The biggest African-American welfare queen in this country is Elon Musk. Elon Musk's entire fortune is built off of government handouts. Just a couple months ago, he got $2.9 billion from the federal government to work on the human landing system for the Artemis mission. Right now, we just had a landing of a SpaceX rocket yesterday uh, as part of the commercial crew program started under President Obama, where the government gave Elon Musk $2.9 billion to invest, but that was governmental risk. That was government money. They now have signed $14 billion in contracts with them, which is where we're talking about the privatized gains. So when African Americans say they're not in favor of a system, it's because 
because we have never had access to those parts of the system. You're not going to see a black welfare queen like Elon Musk because we don't have access. So until we have par parity and equity in a system, then of course people are going to be against it when they say it only benefiting one group. 30 seconds. Sure. I, I want to piggyback on, on Shamika's point. I think the, the notion that, that black folk are um, more open to socialism, I think, is because some of us may get the notion that somebody's going to give us some of their money. But it's not that we want to give somebody else um, some of our money. One of the things I'll say, when you look at the rise and fall of Black Lives Matter, people like the, the, the co-founders, the Ibram, Ibram Kendis, who say that uh, uh, capitalism is the racist twin of of race is the evil tin of racism mm -hmm. are also charging $45,000 for a one hour speech and want you to buy their books and watch all their TV programs. So I, th these people love capitalism so much they found a the market and the raw materials of the bodies of dead black men and that's how they made all their money. 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, I don't I also agree. I don't think black people, by any stretch of the word, is, is against capitalism. Uh, the problem is freedmen in this country have been locked out of capitalism. Uh, if I want to lock you out of capitalism, I'm going to deny you the land that you're owed. If I want to deny you capitalism, I'm going to deny you cash payments that are owed to you. Things that I gave other countries and other uh, groups of people to be well and to be sufficient, Time. I'm going to deny that to you if I don't want you to be involved in capitalism. All right, next question. Do you support reparations? And if so, what would be an example of how that would work and what impact would this have on American culture and race relations? Right side, panelist one, you have two minutes. Um, do I support reparations? I think there's a lot of, there's a more nuanced discussion to be had. Um, I don't support reparations as in um, giving out checks. I know a lot of people actually agree with that. Now, let me be clear. If the federal government decides to give, um, you know, descendants of slave a check, run me mine. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want that check. And I say that as someone whose um, paternal ancestor was on that Metamora ship that sailed from Carolina all the way down to Georgia. So yes, run me mine. What I think can happen, I think what happens is the discussion of reparations, most people think like a numerical number. I think that reparations, to the extent it will happen at all, will be a continuation of what governments are already doing. So that is funding different programs where we are disproportionately, you know, disproportionately impacted, meaning some of the things that I talked about that the Trump administration was focused on. And by all, um, you know, to give Biden his own prop. Um, there are things that the Biden administration is focused on. Every president, every government, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, Democrat, local level, um, federal level, they are doing things to address the vestiges that we often talk about here. The challenge in having these discussions is, is that one, people say, well, if you don't give me the money, then that's going to be a problem. Well. It can't be that sort of either or, you know, that, that sort of proposition. I think that there are advances that we can make, as I said, with different programming, where we can um, specifically targeting programming. But as far as an overall, do I support reparations? I think that the um, conversation itself needs to be more broader. And I'm glad we're actually having the conversation here. Again, if Uncle Sam want to give me a check, <laughs> I absolutely support a check. But I do think that the government should continue, and I think all of us would agree that the government should continue doing things to address the Sorry. history that my friend Hi. M. Reese over there likes to talk about. We're not still there today, but there are things that the government can continue to do. And I think on the subject of reparations, that's what I would do to address it. What you want? Two minutes. The problem that we have here is that we've got people asking if the government is going to cut us a check. We shouldn't even be asking if the government is going to do anything for us. Why? Because we know in 1865 with H.R. 51, with H.R. 216, that the government already agreed to give the freedmen 
not just descendants of slavery, but the freedmen, those who were freed and emancipated, those people were already due something from being released from slavery, and that is supposed to be paid. Now, here's the problem. All we have to do is come and collect that check. You don't have to ask them to cut a check. They already agreed to cut a check. That bill was approved. Those acts were approved by Congress in, in 1856. So we don't need to ask for a check. We need to have make sure the check is being cut then, and, and enforce that. What, is that. what does that exactly look like? Well, you were promised if you were a, a freedman, a person, that's a status, first of all. And let's go back to that. We're not just talking about race and color because in the United States, we can't even do decisions based on race based because that's not going to pass the muster of the Supreme Court. They're going to knock that down every time. They're just a distinct group of people who they have a legal status called being a freedman. And those people are due what exactly. Those people are due to receive what the government promised them in 1856. The problem is, is that most people at that time didn't understand what they were what they were obligated to receive, and they've not enforced it. So here we are asking for civil rights and things like that when we were supposed to get land 156 years ago. If we had gotten our land that was protected by the U.S. military, because that's also a part of the bill. See, you got to know what you're entitled to to know what your rights are. Most of us are asking, oh, we want to give us free. We're going to march and all. Okay, that's fine. But do you know what you are entitled to? You can't demand it if you don't know what it is. One minute. Sure. Um, do I support reparations? I, one, I think anybody that thinks another check from the government, because I actually think if we do reparations, it should be a check, and it should be a big, big, juicy check. Because one of the things I'd like to do is forever take the notion that we can't progress as a community until we get reparations off the table. That being said, this is not 1857. This is a large country, millions of people with different political interests from different backgrounds. And one thing I know as a father, if I don't feed any of my kids, they're all going to hate me. If I give all the food to one of them, they're going to hate each other. So if you want to have a republic that we can pass on to our, to our children and our grandchildren, we can't just be thinking about what we say was promised to somebody in 1857. That being said, I'll say this. If reparations ever did come, it would mean the end of the, the racial grievance industry. Because once I pay my student loans off to Sally Mae, the next call she places to me, I said, I'm not answering. I don't owe you anymore. So before you all say, yes, we want reparations, just be sure that you want to go down that road. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I want to go down that road. Okay. And the Japanese Americans were sure they wanted to go down that road. Certain Native American tribes were sure they wanted to go down that road. Slave masters themselves were sure they wanted to go down that road. Reparations is how you heal, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I'm up here today. I'm, I, you want to talk about healing a nation, how are you going to heal a nation without addressing reparations? My dear brother, you say you don't believe reparations should be paid in cash payments. I want to ask you a question. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Would you tell European Jewish people that? No. Why? Well, I, I'm not Jewish, so I don't have that. I don't no, I'm asking that. you, why would you tell them, why wouldn't you tell them that you don't support their reparations? For Jewish people? Do you support cash payments to European Jewish people, the descendants for the Holocaust? Based on, well, the Holocaust didn't happen in America. We're I know, but they're, oh, they get cash payments. Yeah, but I'm saying, but we're, the discussion of reparation is a U.S.-based thing, not... Uh, Holocaust. Well, it's a humanity thing, and I think that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the lack of humanity, and not paying Time. reparations impacts that. Mm. Uh, 30 seconds. Uh, I, uh, is that going to be a paper check or an electronic <laughs> uh, funds transfer? That's, <laughs> that's where I stop then. <laughs> so anybody want the rest of my time? Well, uh, yeah, and, and um, to just piggyback off of that, I think most people will say if the federal government wants to cut a check to a uh, uh, descendants of slave, we'll get that check. But again, what can we do to repair our communities? I don't think that just a check is enough, but I think that we can do a lot in our community about funding programs to address these things. Things. The check, mm, I'll be happy with it, but if I don't get it, I'll be fine too.
All right, so just because we were talking about this issue of the Jewish community when it regards reparations, it is intellectually dishonest to support the nation of Israel and not to support reparations for African Americans. The nation of Israel as a creation is reparation for slavery during the Roman Empire. Their reparations came 2,000 years later, not from the people who enslaved them, but from Palestinians. And, they were, and that was created by a Zionist movement that started in the 1870s. So it's not ancient history. So if we can do it for the Jewish community and repair reparations from 2,000 years ago, there's no reason we can't do reparations Time. from 200 years ago. Thank you. Moving along, now we're going to talk about crime. The left has poisted that defunding the police is a popular idea that benefits the black community. However, according to a Gallup poll conducted in August of 2020, 81% of black Americans want either the same amount of policing or more of it. Why then is defund the police marketed to us as a black issue? Right side, panelist one, you have two minutes. Because uh, much of the political discourse uh, um, within the black community is driven by ideologues and activists. Um, before I moved over to the Heritage Foundation, I worked 15 years in DC government. The last year was in the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. And I can tell you one thing, I've been to plenty of community meetings, homeowners associations. I've never seen a property owner in a particular community that has high rates of crime say that they want fewer police resources. Never, not once. Because when, when mom and grandma want to walk to the, to the grocery store, or not bodega, I'm from New York, to the bodega or the corner store or the laundromat, they want to be able to do that uh, without being, uh, being afraid of, of, of getting shot or accosted, or even seeing guys, you know, engaging in whatever type of criminal activity. So we have activists and ideologues driving a conversation. Ironically, these people oftentimes live in gated communities. Mm -hmm. They don't live in the neighborhoods where the shootings are going on. Okay. I, I know that because nobody with common sense would have bullets coming through your window and then turn around and say, we need fewer police resources. Right. That, that, that being said, I, I'll say this, I, I, it, it is an interesting dichotomy. When the left says that the greatest threat to black folks' lives is, is white supremacist domestic terrorism, again, they want all the federal resources, state and local, to pour into the community. Again, you can't find these guys, but they're reports. But when it's young men being shot down, right? As I said, I, I was with this office every morning, 8.30, Here's a list of, the, of the, the people who've been shot and killed over the last 24 hours. When it's young men being shot down, then the response from black folk is, we need fewer police resources. And what did you see in the year 2020, in the year of defund the police, when we spent a quarter of the year locked up in our houses, a 30% increase in homicides nationally, the largest increase in 60 years. You know who bore the brunt of that? Young black men. As I said, homicide is a leading cause of death for young black men. Don't let anybody tell you it's grand wizards and, and grand dragons. Well, well, the reason you, the, the difference between this concept of defund the police and what the community asked for, because defund the police isn't a thing that comes from the black community. This is a thing that was created by right-wing media, the same way we talked about critical race theory <laughs> earlier, uh, the same way we talk about it now. And the reason that we know this, the reason we know this, because I've been working in the black community for the last 25 years when it comes to violence pre uh, prevention. I've been working in civil rights for the last 20 years when it comes to these issues. And at the end of the day, what, what really is going on, and I, go, uh, I give props to our Governor Brian Kemp, Republican Governor of Georgia, because before being one of the most progressive governors in the nation, when it comes to quote unquote defund the police. Because under the Kemp administration, we repealed the state's chokehold law. We repealed the state's uh, law with regards to citizens' arrests after the death of Ahmaud Aubrey uh, at the hands of the big Michaels. We got the appointment of a special prosecutor in that case to ensure that those individuals will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Uh, under his administration, we've been able to pass a, a new law which requires that if an individual is suffering from a mental health episode, when police respond, they have to have an mental health expert with them. When they talk about this idea of defund the police, what people are talking about is making sure the police can concentrate on their core duty of preventing violent crime and property crime. So when it comes to in high school where we have armed police officers patrolling the hallways, how about instead of doing that, we just pay some security people? That's what they call defund the police. If somebody is suffering from a medical issue, like we saw in uh, with Richard Brooks in Atlanta, Georgia, where he was in a Wendy's drive through but he had passed out because he was drunk, you send an ambulance in that situation instead of two armed police officers. That way the police officers can go fight crime and the ambulance can take the sick person 
to the hospital. So when you have right-wing media create this concept of defund the police, it was funded by the police unions because they have found that any form of ref any type of reform that seeks to increase the likelihood of African Americans being able to survive uh, police encounters, that they consider that to be in large part uh, part of this concept of defunding the police that has to be opposed. So when we look at the facts on the ground, nobody's right. calling for defund the police. We're calling for the same policing everyone else gets. One minute. Uh, I agree with Robert. I don't believe defund the police came from black people. However, I'm, going, I'm not afraid of liberal white women. And so I definitely think you have a lot of them running around screaming things that, like Delano said, they don't have an issue with. This is coming from white progressives, not just something that's made up by right wing media. And so why do they market it as a black thing? The same reason why they market everything as a black thing. Brown is the new black so that we can have empathy for illegal immigrants and people that decided to float over here on the inner tube. LGBTQ is the new black so that we can have empathy for a marginalized group. So they always use the plight of our ancestors to make us feel like we have to show sympathy and empathy and pull on our heartstrings. That's why it's marketed as something for coming from black people. Black people just don't want to be stopped and get their ass whooped for an expired license plate. It's not that they want to take away from the police officers and they, it's not that they don't know who's actually providing help and assistance in the community. Left side, one minute. Defund the police is intellectually dishonest. It's a phrase used to prey on the black community. It's why? We'll get to that in a minute. What we do know is that historically, the police department in America was created as slave patrols. And to this day, the industrial prison complex, which is the difference between, as you pointed out, a black man being stopped and being either dead or alive, or a black man being stopped and being free and a slave. Why is that? Well, I'll tell you once again, the 13th Amendment only, only outlawed slavery unless a person is found to have violated a law and they are found guilty of a crime. What does that mean? I'm gonna say it again. You can put a person back in slavery. There's a loophole on it. All slaves aren't freed. You can put a black man back in slavery just by arresting him. So if you can put them back in slavery, then the police definitely are something that you would stoke a person's fear about. But it's not something that we are inherently un uh, afraid of. There is a desire to be safe in your person and not be made to be a slave or killed. That's all it is. 30 seconds. Um, the, def the defund the police phrasing actually came from the Black Visions Collective, which is a black liberations movement. It had nothing to do with the right wing. What happened is, is that the left began to realize that they couldn't explain what de defund mean. What Robert said is actually it makes sense. What they were talking about is reallocating funds to different things like mental health services and other things. That's not defund, that's reallocate. So it was a messaging problem that they had. To Reese's point, no. This whole thing of slavery, we can't keep going back to the 1800s or the 1600s to explain where we are today. No, black men can't be seen, sent back into slavery where they were hog tied to stumps and left to die. That is slavery. What you're talking about I'm is not slavery. And what, do you, what do you call leaning on some? What do you call leaning on somebody's neck for eight seconds and that's them not waking up that's, tomorrow? That's police violence. That's not slavery. <laughs> All right. Well, we got 30 seconds. Same difference. Yes, uh, slavery does come in many forms. And um, one thing black people have figured out over the years is that white Americans tend to care about two things, loss of life and loss of profit. Let me say that again, loss of life a loss of profit. I think we all agree in this room, we don't want a bunch of armed black people going in the police station uh, raising hell. Well, if you don't want to harm a man physically, how do you get justice out of a man? How do you make him act right? You do that by affecting his pockets. Time. Don't blame that on black America. Blame that on the actions of the police. Okay, next question. Violent crime is disproportionately committed by black criminals, particularly murders and robberies. 
What explains the culture of violence? Right side, you have two minutes. So I think it's important when we talk about violence in community to understand that, in, what is it called, interracial violence is a thing. Most white people kill white people. Most black people kill black people. Most Hispanic people kill Hispanic people. That we know. The context of crime in our community, I think that this is our larger problem that we don't have enough discussions about. The issues in our community, if you look at places like Washington, D.C., Chicago, and many other places, crime is committed by a very, 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 very small percentage of people. So if we talk about, we want to use the phrase black on black crime, a very small, 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 small number of black people commit crimes. Many of them, most of them, are actually repeat offenders. Right. The issue with crime in the black community is that we, in many ways, condone most of this. We don't accept personal responsibility for the decisions. We know you shouldn't be out there robbing people. You shouldn't be out there killing people. We shouldn't be out there beating our girlfriends or our boyfriends or whatever you want to say. We shouldn't be out there doing this, and we don't need the government to tell us that. People know the difference between night and day. If you use a gun to kill people, you were told as a child, Violence is wrong. You shouldn't be going around fighting people. So when we have this discussion, what typically happens, what always happens, is that we say, because of the vestiges of racism, this is why crime exists in the community. I know that many of my ancestors who were those who were hogtied to those stumps, they would love to have the conveniences that we have now, but they weren't out there killing each other. There are conversations that we can have about the personal Irrespon well, irresponsible behavior of many in our community, and we don't have enough discussions about it because we like deflecting to systemic racism, or as I'm sure my friend Reese would say, slavery. All of those things can't explain where we are now. There is an issue of personal responsibility, and as someone who lives in the community today, I know that many Everybody in the community hates the amount of crime and vice that's in the community. Black, white, Hispanic, it doesn't matter who you are. Well, black on black crime is a bit of a canard. And, uh, and I'm going to explain that in a couple of seconds. But we were having this exact same conversation, the same debate in the year 1822. The question will be, why do so many Irish people keep killing so many Irish people? Because that was the issue of the day. And we were having this exact same conversation in 1922. The question would be, why are so many Italian people killing so many Italian people? Because that was the conversation of the day. And we were talking about media glorifying crime and the culture of that the nature. You can look at every mobster movie from the 1920s and the 1930s of them glorifying Bonnie and Clyde and so on and so forth. But when you t think about the why it is that we're not having these conversations about the Irish American community today and not having these conversations about the Italian American community today is because in World War II, we needed all hands on deck to fight that at war. And when people got back, they got their ticket into whiteness. Instead of being known as Italians or uh, Irish, they got, in, they got to dip into the great American melting pot and come out as regular white Americans. And they were therefore privy to all the benefits and, uh, uh, and economic development that was thereafter. They were able to get GI bills. They were able to get low interest loans. They were able to go to college um, as a result thereof. So when we talk about the previous conversation on reparations, is literally the word is repair. So we're talking about repairing the black community. So the same way that those in, uh, communities need to repair, and once they were repaired, they no longer have this uh, Notre Dame fighting Irish uh, type of uh, stereotype around their communities. When we repair the damage done to the black community, because as we said, history doesn't start on Wednesday. History starts at the beginning, and you carry that weight with you uh, fully along the lines until it is repaired, until we do the process necessary to repair damage done to the black community and to economically restore the black community, then you will have the issues, but this idea that somehow black people are just genetically programmed to kill other black people is not and never has been and never will be true. The same that it was not true about the Irish, the same that it was not true about the uh, Italians, the same that it was not true about any other community. Panelist two, one minute. So, so I, I actually agree with Robert. I, I don't think there's any vice nor virtue that's inherent to any person based on skin color or ethnicity or nationality. But, but the, the notion that we have to wait on more government programs for us to stop killing each other is one I just cannot accept. I want to go back to the, to the other question real, real quick. I refuse to let 
um, my, my fellow panelists try to, try to gaslight us and say, oh, uh, defund the police didn't come from black folk. What do you all think Black Lives Matter ran on? They wanted to abolish the police, right? This black Colin Lives Kaepernick, Matter the most famous uh, athlete activist, wants to abolish the police. So don't let, don't let people flim flam you and make you think that uh, right wing people came up with defund the police. That being said, the, the black homicide victimization rate is seven, time, seven times higher than, than the white one. The only time the black left wants to talk about a black person who's killed is when they're killed by a white person. There's no greater example of white super, superiority complex than that. Left side, one minute. Yeah, um, I want to be very clear. Black on black crime was created. White on black crime is the root to black on black crime. If I want to create a violent community, some of the things I'm going to do is put a liquor store in every corner. Uh, I'm going to put guns in your neighborhood. Do anybody know any black gun owners or black gun makers in the United States? We're not making these weapons. Uh, if I want to destroy a community, <laughs> One of the things I'm going to do is make sure that I take the black man out of the household and leave the black woman and the child susceptible to violent crime, susceptible to not being protected. Uh, this has been pushed by the right and their support of police, even when they do wrong. If you want an example of that, all you got to do is watch Fox News. This is being perpetuated. Time. This image of black on black crime is constantly pushed on us so that you will view the black man and be afraid even Time. when he's just wearing a hoodie. Panelist three, 30 seconds. I'm going to say something my mother used to always say, and that is we have more excuses than a nigga going to jail. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I don't care what you call it. Call it crime within the community. Call it black on black crime. What I'm concerned about is the actual dead bodies. In 1945, black people were 25% of all murders. Now we are 60% of all murders. So I don't care what we call it, but we have to address that our black men are dying. And that's what's important to me, that we actually are concerned about the number of deaths and not what it's called. 30 seconds. It's amazing when we decide to be concerned. First of all, the question on its face is a fallacy and intellectually dishonest. Violent crime, or what explains a culture of violence in the black community? Flim flam. The people that lynched and took their children to watch the lynchings, that's a culture of violence. Yes. The people who raped and pillaged communities of people and brought them over to work for free, that's a culture of violence. The people who raped the women once they got here to create a whole group of mulattoes, that's a culture of violence. The people who were blowing up churches where only nine little black girls were, or little black girls were in there praying, that's a culture of violence. Dylan Roof, who went up in a church and shot nine people who were trying to praise nine. the Lord, that's a culture of violence. So to me, we have to ask a, a question that's not intellectually dishonest. Nine. I bet you if the freedmen were repatriated, they wouldn't be playing a zero-sum game theory with people who look like them. <laughs> All right, now, our last topic for the night, Black Lives Matter. Jesus. The BLM riots of 2020 are estimated to have cost over $2 billion, making them the costliest riots in American history. It is reported that dozens of people were killed and thousands injured, including the slain black police officer, David Dorn. This is hardly talked about, and in fact, the left-wing media and politicians continue to deny the violence, labeling 2020 the summer of love. More than 90% of all people charged with crimes connected to BLM rioting have all had their charges against them dropped. Compare this to the January 6th riot, which almost two years later still receives round-the-clock news coverage in an unprecedented FBI and DOJ manhunt to apprehend people on misdemeanor charges and zero accused individuals having their cases dismissed. Why was the months, why was the months long violence and destruction of BLM dismissed and justified while the violence and destruction caused by Trump supporters has been labeled by Democrats as akin to Pearl Harbor and 9-11? Right side, you have two minutes. 
Yeah, so I think this is part of the strategy when I talked about the for-profit industry. Now, let's be clear. Both sides are going to view these things differently. Um, I, I view it a little differently. What we know about the Black Lives Matter riots, true. And I'm sure my, pet, my um, friends on the left would say that the people out there, not everybody was rioting. That's absolutely true. There were protests that or rallies that turned into riots, and most of the people out there weren't doing those sort of things. The media covered it differently because it was considered kind of like the summer of love. They were doing it to fight racial injustice. They were burning down cities. They were burning down businesses. They were looting businesses. They were doing all of these things in the name of systemic racism, police brutality, or whatever it is that you want to do. On January 6th, there was another. In fact, it was the third, and I can say as I'll out myself as someone who went to the original Millions More March um, that was in November of 2020, where it was a peaceful event. There was a second event. The what happened on January 6th was the third iteration of these type of rallies. There were people, most of them, almost all of them, including the members of Congress who were standing alongside Donald Trump on that day, they were very peaceful. There were those who were irresponsible. And we know out of the 900 plus people who were there, they were they have been convicted overwhelmingly on things like trespassing misdemeanor charges. They should be held accountable. We should be able to say that the people who did those type of things should be held accountable. But there was no issue of a difference between if it were black people versus white people, because we do know the only person that was killed on January 6th was a white Donald Trump supporter. That was not the case during any of the Black Lives Matter protests. So for the discussion of policing and how they handled it differently, Police killed no one during any of the Black Lives Matter protests. In fact, no one was killed by law enforcement. Those are facts that we can actually talk about, but it shouldn't be that did Black Lives Matter was just a summer of protests Time. and they were doing something for their rights. And then when it comes to January 6th, all of them are insurrectionists, despite no one has been actually um, convicted Time. on that charge. Left side, you have two minutes. Well, well, to Malik's point, facts matter. And we have to use historical context and narratives when it comes to interpreting current events. Uh, if you look at when Mussolini took power in Italy, he took a group of his supporters, they walked into the seat of power, and they overthrew the government, and then they t led to World War II, years of fascism. Ten years before Hitler came to power, you had the Beer Hall Putsch or the Munich Putsch when Hitler and the early forms of the Nazi party stormed the parliament, uh, tried to or stormed the Reichstag, uh, tried to install themselves as the government there. Very similar. Uh, if you want to go back further in history, 1799, during the course of the French Revolution, Napoleon locked the entirety of the uh, legislature there in France in uh, Le Coup de Chateau de Saint Cloud in 1799 and would overthrew the government, which led to the 20 years of the Napoleonic War. So when we say these people were just misdemeanor people walking through the capital, what was their goal? Their goal was to stop the certification and the installation of the new president and the peaceful transition of power in a way that we have not seen since the midnight appointments of Marbury versus Madison. What their point was, was that he did not agree with the democratic process and wanted to rewrite the Constitution because fundamentally we have to understand, France right now is on their fifth republic. Republics do not stay in forever. This is how republics fall. That's why those people were prosecuted for the activities they did, because they were seeking to destroy the American Republic as we know it today and replace it with the second American Republic in the image of Donald Trump. And that is not what the American people signed up for. On this question, the BLM quote unquote riots, Black Lives Matter have been the most successful some, uh, social movement since the anti-apartheid movement in the early uh, 1980s. You need proof. If you look at anti-lynching legislation, that did not happen in the entire history of the United States of America until African American society stand up and demand it. Over 150 different laws have been passed by municipal governments around the country and as a result of this. We've had untold investments in black communities as a result of this. As France Fanon once put it, revolution has a cleansing nature, and that's what we saw. Okay. Um, one minute. You asked why was the destruction of BLM dismissed versus what happened on January 6th, and uh, the, the answer is just simple. The left hates the right, 
and they're in charge, and they're controlling the narrative. We like to believe that there's good in, in these people. We hear people so many times lie and say, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Well, why not? Because I would. I want my worst enemy to get monkeypox. I want my worst enemy to have an eczema flare up and can't sleep at night. We have to understand that we are in a war versus is good versus evil. So when we think that they're going to actually do something or say something in our favor, it's a lie. That's why it's so important to know what side you're on. The line is, has been drawn in the sand. Either you're going to be for good or you're going to be for evil. The devil is a liar and the truth ain't in him. So stop looking for the truth in what we already know is a lie. Okay. One minute. So the Declaration of Independence says that when people have decided that the government, uh, the United States government is not working to their liking, that they have the power and the right to change it. Only citizens have that right. So on January 6th, U.S. citizens showed up to enforce their rights under the contract that is the Constitution. Okay, fine or the Declaration of Independence, which was then ratified as the Constitution. Okay, fine. So here's the problem. The problem is, is that when those people that went into the Capitol decided they wanted to enforce their rights, they were treated with fairness and dignity and respect. There were, they were allowed to walk in. They weren't shot down like dogs they were, at the yes, doorway. Yes, they were actually shot. They weren't the shot. The woman shot herself, I thought. No, <laughs> no are you kidding me? I thought she had a good, okay. No, it was a police officer who actually shot, shot All her. right, well, we got one person, try, okay, I'll, I'll recant my statement. My point still stands. They were not overwhelmingly level down, mowed down with artillery like black people would have been. Why? Time. Because black people don't have the same contract. We are not in privity. We do not Time. have the same rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Thus, Black Lives Matter was a, a basically a Time. begging to have rights that the Constitution entitles other people to. Come on, respond to this, Delano. <laughs> Come on, brother. 30 seconds. <laughs> I, I, I want to respond to something that Robert said. I think um, BLM was a very successful movement, and it did lead to untold investment um, in the white communities that Patrice Cullors and April, um, Patrice Cullors and Alicia Garza brought their, brought their houses. I do not understand how anybody would say that BLM was successful when, again, the homicide rate in 2020, when the, the raw number of homicides went up 30 percent. And again, the majority of those were, were young um, black men. So BLM was successful in putting money into the pockets of the co-founders. That is it. And they wanted to disrupt the nuclear family. So that should have told you long ago what their agenda was. 30 seconds. Yes, um, I think Black Lives Matter started off with good intentions. Uh, I think it was black people wanting to come together to say that we matter. Not to say that white lives don't matter. The whole thing with Black Lives Matter was saying our lives matter too. Not only. Our, ma our lives matter also. And how are you going to compare people fighting for the justice of people getting murdered in cold blood to people invading a government building, that being the Capitol? I don't know how you do that. When you invade a Capitol and security guards are telling you, don't come in, I think you're probably going to get shot. Okay, all right, next question. According to the Black Lives Matter website, the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision opens the door to statewide bans and subsequent rulings that will harm black people disproportionately. Since the Roe decision in 1973, 19 million black babies have been aborted, which is nearly half of the current black population in America. How can the organization that insists they have the authority on protecting black lives also claim it is detrimental to black people to have restricted access to a procedure that has ended 19 million black lives? Right side, you have two minutes. This is a phenomenal question, and it puts many of the left's um, preferred policy prescriptions and much of his rhetoric under close scrutiny. Now, the left will tell you that any organization that has a racist history should be dismissed. They will tell you that anything that has a, a, disproportionate, um, a disproportionate effect on, on black bodies 
should be rejected. It'll tell you that anything um, where, where black people are being subjected to, to violence should be rejected, unless it's abortion and unless it's Planned Parenthood, right? I, I, grew, I grew up in New York City. In 2016, half of all black women's pregnancies ended in abortion in New York City. It was a close to about 22,000 on each. Live births and abortions. Now, the people who say that black lives matter, I'm not under, I don't understand how they can say that and then also um, uh, promote a policy that has a disproportionate effect on the black community. The other thing that I notice is that Democrats push abortion with much more force, vigor, and passion than they do the natural family and marriage. There's a reason for that. When they tell you that they're abolitionists, you should ask yourself, what or who is it that they want to abolish? So, Black Lives Matter, as I said, it does not care about black folks. It's a Marxist organization. It rejects the nuclear family. It said more about being trans-affirming and queer-affirming than it did about police brutality and its 13 original principles. And, and one of the things, I'll, I'll say this. I, I'm against abortion. I do not think that um, the, the manner of conception determines the, the value of a life. I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe that God created all human beings in his image, according to Genesis 127. I believe that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. I do not believe that, that black children should be killed in the womb, or any children for that matter. And I would like to know from, from and they can answer this question, do you all believe that uh, uh, abortion, which has a disproportionate effect on, on the black community, is an aspect of white supremacy? Yes or no? Say the question again. What? Say the question again. Ask that question one more time. I, I, I wanted to know whether you all believe that abortion, which has a disproportionate effect, and let, let me be very clear with my terms. I'm talking about the intentional ending of a human life in the womb. I'm not talking ectopic pregnancy. I'm not talking miscarriage. Those things are, are, are handled in a different way medically. But do you all believe that abortion, which intentionally ends the life of, of a child in the womb who otherwise would have been born, which has a disproportionate effect on the black community, is one aspect of, black, of, of white supremacy? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go I'm going to go in now. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me, Delano, let me tell you what is an aspect of white supremacy in terms of a black woman, okay? A black woman has never had autonomy over her body in this country. She was used as a baby manufacturing machine for her slave owner who needed more and more people. When they stopped allowing slaves to be brought over to the United States, it began then her turn to be impregnated every possible chance she got. Where do you think they got the word mother effer from? They used to put a paper bag over a black woman's head and they would send in her relatives, whether it was her son, her uncle, her brother, her cousin, it didn't matter. They were just used as mules to recreate for white supremacy. So that's what happens when white supremacy is allowed. Black women have no control over their womb, their body, and anything else. And so what we're having now is people giving, being returned the ability to decide what they want to do for themselves. First of all, the next question is, how are you telling me that black people are disproportionately having abortions when it's illegal to even collect that type of uh, information at an abortion clinic? You are not allowed to collect whether a woman is black or white and what, whether she, how many abort. That's something that is, you don't even have to answer those type of questions at a clinic. You can choose to, but that is not mandatory. So even the information that you have is skewered. There is no fact in that. So th th that's issue number one. The facts are false. But two, we're getting back to the fact that Maybe Black Lives Matter was co-opted. Maybe somebody infiltrated that organization and they made the, the goal of it to be LGBTQ and all this other stuff that had nothing to do with the original goal of black people standing up and trying to ask for humanity in this country. That's fine. The point still remains that a woman has the right to do side what she wants to do with her body, her life, and that is her choice. That's time and that time. is something time. that she has never had in this country. And now we are definitely time. seeing that being brought back. I, I, okay. I, 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 didn't, I didn't hear an actual answer to my question. I would mark that witness as unresponsive, <laughs> you can, you can moderator. So right, you, you answered it. Damn, that, that's me personally, but yeah. I got a minute, oh, yeah. I, I got a minute so, after this, so next. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know what? We're almost done, so if you want to answer the actual no, the, the actual question yeah. that I asked. Okay. Can I? 
Am I? Is it my turn? Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's, your, turn. it's your turn. It's your turn. Okay. It's your turn. All right, you, okay. you go. No, I just want to ask Reese as a black woman if she had autonomy over her body when she cocked her legs up and got that baby in her. Okay, throat. we're gonna just go so ahead and say that. No, no, absolutely lying. not. That is not how we will address our fellow panelists. That was not how, no, you will, no, this, stop right now. All right. This is not how we talk as black folks in the community. We will not talk about a black woman cocking her legs over anything else. You will respect the people on this panel. You will respect the people in this room. You will respect yourself by talking in a manner and a fashion that is appropriate. Continue. Okay. I would like to ask Reese as a black woman, I mean, you got to spread your legs, don't you? I mean, that's what I thought. As a black woman, did you have autonomy over your body when you spread your legs and got that baby in your stomach? So we can talk as proper as we want to, but the truth is you decided to have children. And so what I want us to stop Okay, I'm going to interrupt at, you. You I got seven seconds, but let me just go here. About the fact that black women don't have the ability my to fiance have and over I their body. Met, my fiance and I met, we sat down after being engaged and wrote down a list of four names that we wanted to name our children after his mother and, I'm sorry, his grandfather and my grandmother. We decided to plan a family. That is a decision that I, a woman who's 30 something years old with multiple degrees and several uh, abilities to secure herself, decided to do by planning a family with her fiance. But guess what? You Every black woman is not you talked and we've heard enough. Question. Every black woman has not had that uh, education, opportunity, and ability to move forward and, and gain something for herself. And so if she learns something at, in the middle of the game, in the fourth quarter, the third quarter, whether it's the third month or the fourth month, she learns that this person is going to walk out on her. She learns that this person has been unfaithful. She learns that she's not able to provide for herself. If she decides that this is not a decision she wants to continue with because of Hi. new information coming into her at four or five or six, four or five or four or five months, she's got a right up until what is called quickening, All right, what is me, called quickening to interject. make that decision to terminate that life and do what's best for her as a woman. Let me interject. Hold on. So just to be clear, you're, you're asking literally, does she have autonomy over her body because she had the choice to... Her, her point was black women have never had the ability to have autonomy over our bodies, and that is a lie. This is not, the, we're not in color purple days where Mr. would just climb on top of us and do his business. This is 2022, and women have the ability to decide yes or no, I want to have sex or I don't. I want to take birth control or I don't. I want to have this baby or I don't. So we need to stop telling these lies as if we just happen to fall on a penis and get pregnant. That's not how it works. We actually have the choice to do that. And I don't care how Reese decided to sit down with her fiance, whether they marry or any of that. I want us to stop telling lies. And as someone who is a product of rape, since uh, Robert wanted to shut me up. As someone who is a product of rape, my mother was raped at 14, walking to cheer camp. I am that baby. So when y'all sit here and talk about something that is less than 1% of all abortions, as if that is the, the reason why we have abortions, that is not the truth. And I want us to stop lying about it. And I want us to be honest. And I want us as women to be responsible and have accountability. And Stop trying to blame everybody else for what's going on with our bodies. We have the ability and the right to choose, and that's just what it is. All right. Uh I believe it's back to the, I'm not even sure because it's... Yeah, so, so I'm just going to hop in here for a minute okay. and just talk about this. And I'm not going to buy by the clock in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so I'm pro-life. I'm severely pro-life. I'm right to life. Hold on with it. You're going to dislike me in a second. But that life does not... For Republicans often, it seems that life begins at conception and ends at birth. 
I'm talking about the totality of the person, the totality of the human being. And when we talk about the question of life versus, uh, uh, life versus anti-abortion, what we're really having a conversation about is governmental power. Does the government have the power to enforce those things on the individual? I don't believe that it does. So I think that what we have to do as a Christian and caring community is work towards the place where, uh, where abortion is obsolete. It's less so about whether it's illegal or legal. It's a question of will this child have clean and, uh, clean and safe housing when they come out of that womb? Will they have access to prenatal care so we can cut down the uh, birth mortality rate for African American women? Can we ensure that we as a nation can provide them with an education that will prepare them for the next generation? So instead of thinking about when this life ends, because it seems like a lot of people don't care about that child once it walks out of the room, it's more about regulating what that woman does in the bedroom there before. I think that we need to take the conversation away Away from this legal versus illegal contest, and what can we do as a loving and holistic Christian community as a nation to ensure that it is obsolete so no woman would ever want to make that choice? It's not about taking away their choice, it's about making sure they don't have to use that choice. I guess the time is flexible. Yeah, so, so what Robert, I actually agree with Robert on that. What he's referring to is this whole life argument. Um, Republicans are typically criticized by Democrats because they say you aren't concerned what happens what, when you know, the baby comes out of the womb. I can give you stats after stats of, all around the country of Republican governors, Republican mayors, Republican politicians doing the very things to fund those type of programs. On the issue of race and abortion, and whether or not we have that sort of information, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, in their report, reported legal abortions by race of women who obtained abortion by state of occurrence. It's definitely collected. Disproportionately in, in some places, like Alabama, black women, 62% of abortion, white women, 30% of abortion. This is repeated in areas all around the country. Georgia, 65% black women. White women, 21%. This is consistent. Yes, I'm pro-life. I've moved in my pro-life position. I do believe that there should be exceptions. And well, I'm endoscopic. I can't even remember the name of it. Ectopic. Ectopic. Ectopic present, um, you know, pregnancies. Every law, and I think almost every law in the country, provides those type of exceptions. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if... Um, the abortion has been, well, we know abortion hasn't been banned anyway, but there are exceptions built into these laws, and we should be able to have, I, I don't think I'm ever going to agree with people who are pro-choice and say that a woman should have a choice to abort, because for me, that is a child. It is a life. It isn't just a fetus. It isn't just, oops, it's a life. And from my pro-life position, I believe that we should protect that life at all costs. We can get into debates about when it begins, you know, if it's eight weeks or when. We can have all of those debates. But for me and my purposes, that is a life. And I believe we should do everything we can to protect that life and not be just callous and have these conversations about, is my body my choice? There's another body in there, too. I believe in helping to make a choice for that one. Yes. Um, most black people uh, are conservative on this issue. Uh, most black people I know are pro-life. And that needs to be understood. If you want to talk about abortion, we can't have a conversation without talking about parent planhood. And we can't talk about parent planhood without talking about Margaret Satcher. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher was a white supremacist. But it's not good enough to just know that she was a white supremacist. Who is the party that is always dog whistling the white supremacist? That'd be the right. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> What? Would anyone like to respond? Yeah, I, 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 would, I, would, I, would, I would like to respond real quick. I mean, um, I, I heard what Robert said when I, when I first asked my question. He responded, and he hit me with the, whole, the pro all of life stuff. Let, let me be very clear. Men are responsible for the children that they create, not the federal government. Okay? So let's, let's, let's start there. One of the reasons that um, the abortion rates are disproportionately high in the black community is because our marriage rates are lower. Generally speaking, the women who seek abortions are unmarried women, right? Because anybody who's married and you, and you tell your husband, babe, look, we're expecting, he, oh, my 
goodness gracious, yes, yes, yes. Because that's, that's what you get when two people come together to have sex. A baby is not a consequence of sex. It is the fruit of sex and, and reproduction. So, but at the end of the day, the notion that a black child is better off dead than being raised by a poor single mother is one that I reject. And for some reason, the left, and, and, and Reese brought up um, slavery, uh, but for some reason, the left today is as, uh, as intent on legalizing abortion as Democrats uh, were in the 1800s in legalizing slavery. So my thing is this, either black lives matter or they don't. Either we have human dignity, we believe in human dignity or we don't. The notion that uh, a, a child's life or a person's life is conditional on whether they're gonna grow up in a middle class neighborhood whether they're a white person, whether they have health insurance, whether the community has uh, free daycare, is one that you cannot accept. Because if you want to go down that road, you're going you, you to get into some ugly territory. And Robert should know this. One of the jobs of the government is to determine under what circumstances one individual can take the life of another. That is the government's role. That's one of its roles. And there's no moral code that I know of in which taking the life of an innocent person is seen as a, as a morally justifiable act until it comes to abortion. So, I'll end with this. For some reason, the people who believe in black liberation, we support black lives, until it comes to abortion, because they think that fewer black people is a sign of liberation in this country, and I disagree with that position. Well, well there's, two, Let's, there's two points on rebuttal, and I'm done. Really quick, just so we can wrap it up, I'm gonna let you respond, but you're gonna get one minute, and. Um, one minute, and then we're just going to move on to the next thing. Okay. So the, uh, one of the point of the statistics that Malik presented, if I remember the, that Kaiser survey correctly, uh, the way that the numbers are tabulated is not from the medical providers. They do surveys of women as they walk outside of the clinic, and they voluntarily report those in that information. So it's not uh, truthfully scientific. It's more so uh, how many women feel like talking to the survey taker on the way out the door. And we know for a fact that wealthy women, uh, whether they're Republican or Democrat, uh, they have their abortions done clandestinely. They're not walking into your local Planned Parenthood, so therefore those statistics don't get counted. Uh, secondarily, to uh, uh, to the uh, point of the previous interlocutor, I think that uh, at the end of the day, when we talk about small C conservatism, small government, uh, the uh, idea that the government cannot tell me what to put into my body, the government can't tell me to get the jab, the government can't tell me what I can put on the internet, I agree with those things, but you cannot then thereafter say that the government has the wholesale authority to determine what happens to an individual's body. And in, as a country, as a point of policy, it is easier for us to come together as a village and take I'm, care of the children in this country than it is to determine whether or not an people are giving I'm, birth and uh, the slippery slope from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, one minute and then we'll move on to the last thing. Um, I don't think I have anything else, but as far as the numbers, these are the numbers that's reported by mm -hmm. the Kaiser yeah. Foundation, and I think those numbers that many organizations and groups actually use to determine who is or who isn't getting abortion. So I think they're important numbers. Correct. And, and the, the CDC collects abortion surveillance statistics. They've been doing it for years. I, I have the data. The notion that they don't collect it by race is, is just simply untrue. The, the data is there. Again. A, a, a child is a unique life. It has its, its own unique DNA. When fertilization occurs, you, again, you have a unique life, not holy mother or, or not holy father. It's the combination of the two. So, so the notion that the government has no say in this is one I just, I just find um, hard to believe, especially, and you all, you all lived through COVID. We went from my, my body, my choice to it's a jab or it's a job. The same people. In fact, sometimes I'll, I'll debate, I'll see people online and they'll, they'll be wholeheartedly uh, pro-abortion and I'll just search on their Twitter and I know every time it'll come up, I'll see what they had to say about the vaccine mandate because for some reason they think that the government can tell you what medication to, to take, but the government can't say, no, you cannot kill that child in, in your womb. Thank you. All right, so now we're gonna close tonight with a final question for our panelists. And for our final question, each panelist will be given one minute to share their thoughts. What is your vision for the black community in 2040, and how can we get there? Right side, you got one minute. Can, can we get two minutes? This is an important <laughs> question. You got two minutes. Can we get two minutes? Can we get two minutes? Yeah. Okay. 2040. 2040. 
Oh, oh, 20, 2040. Okay. <laughs> all right, two minutes. Well, first of all, I should probably ask if there's any other slang words that's going to make Robert want to yell at me because we want us to be there's black, a list. black there's until a list. you're losing the argument. Hey, there's a list. Uh, Don't tip over it. Well, just I just want to know in advance because we all pro-black until I say some slang. Ebonics is fine any other time, but exactly. the moment you're losing the argument, I'm glad you, you want to act all uh, beta man. But anyway, if a man says, uh, 2040... My, what I would like to see is to make America great again. And so many times when a black person says that, we like to say, well, when was America ever great? We love going back to slavery, but America was great to me when I could actually walk through my neighborhood and there was family and there was community and I could take my report card and show, get a dollar for the A's or 50 cent for the B's. America was great when I could go to my neighbor's house and walk right in. The door didn't have to be locked. There wasn't an alarm on. I could go get an ice cream sandwich because that's how we loved each other, and crime wasn't at an all-time high. That's when America was great for me. America has always been great in my lifetime. So what I would like for us to see as, as black people is to stop attaching ourselves to negativity in our culture in an effort to hold on to our black card. Because so many times we attach ourselves to lies and things that are detrimental to our community simply to remain cool. We'll say a lot of lies. We won't have responsibility. We won't take accountability for the things that we know are killing us. We won't take responsibility for the things that we know are, are killing our community. And the reason they can take over the country is because they took over the family, which then took over the community. And now, as a country, we're standing here looking crazy because we stepped away from responsibility and accountability. So when it comes to being in 2040, I want us to realize that we have to stand up and be responsible. We have to be accountable and we have to make sure we shame and turn away from the negative things that will hinder us in our faith, our family, and our country. Okay, so 2040, one of the good things about 2040 is America will be a majority minority nation. Uh, it was really predicted uh, that it would be 2044. Now those have ticked up to 2036. Uh, uh, what will that mean? That will mean that America will, will no longer have a majority race that every group will be part of a multifaceted, multinational, multi-ethnic multi uh, melting pot that we will call the United States of America. And as part of working our way through that is determining now what investments we will make to ensure that the African-American community can achieve parity with every other community. Part of that includes repair. Uh, the, uh, the situation we have spoke on extensively tonight, the necessity of the federal government to fulfill the promises which they gave to our people, to repair the families that they destroyed by stealing individuals from another continent and working them as slaves here uh, over the course of hundreds of years. Secondarily, uh, we have to have a political system that is operational for all, uh, for all people. It cannot simply be that whatever party loses declares the election invalid and then raids the capital. That is a very poor way to run a democracy. What we have to do is reinforce force the conceptualization the idea that all men in this country are created equal, that we're participating in a representative democracy where we all will have a voice, where we all will have a vote, where we'll be able to determine pluralistically what is best for all the individuals, and I think that we are able to do so. We can start building that shining city on the hill that many people uh, have talked about. We can become that republic and that view uh, of freedom and democracy for the world. I found it interesting this week, we're looking at foreign press and on Telegraph, people who are protesting the murder of Mansa Amini and Iran, we're flying Black Lives Matter flags. Wagers in the Zhengjing province in China who are fighting back against an oppressive genocide taking place there, we're flying Black Lives Matter flags. If you look at uh, the Ukrainian offensive right now, you're seeing them taking back uh, swaths of land in both Kharkiv and Kherson. They're t launching a counteroffensive in uh, Zavastopol. Uh, you're seeing the strikes against the Crimean Bridge and the people being freed uh, there in Zaporizhia. Well, what we're seeing is that these people are inspired by the fight and tenacity of the African American community here. And just as the civil rights movement and, uh, uh, inspired liberation movements around the globe during the 1960s, our liberation here can inspire freedom around the globe. 
2040. I'll talk about leading up to 20, 2040. Um, it starts in 2024. That will be, obviously, the um, re-election of Donald Trump. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this, and because we're phrasing this around, you know, black people in the black community. For me, it is important for Tim Scott to be on that ticket in 2024. Um, I think that that type of, um, those type of things that we can do, whether it's a Jennifer Ruth Green out of Indiana, many other black Republicans who are running for office all around the country, we have a slate of, I think we have another one out there, we have a slate of um, candidates who are actually getting into the race and started running for office. I would like to see more of us running for these positions, more of us getting into these boardrooms. And well, I'll tell you something, you know, we talked a lot about the Black Lives Matter. There was a lot of virtue signaling that was happening with Black Lives Matter Plaza. Probably about five or six blocks from us is Black Lives Matter Plaza. Since then, no one's shown up. What I would like for us to do is to have real serious conversations about the things that impact our lives and don't be misled. Don't be scapegoated. Don't be under this virtue signaling of our white liberal friends who will throw up the black power fist when they're out there in Black Lives Matter Plaza, but when it comes to Malik's resume, they're going to throw it away. These are the things that I think we need to start having conversations about. So in 2040, I hope that we will be in a very, uh, you know, diversity. I, I support all of that stuff. But I think our economic power, our political power, we have to do that. And it starts with walking away from the Democratic <laughs> Left side, you have two minutes. I'll take one. America had a twinkle of greatness during the Reconstruction period, when blacks were emancipated, when they created their own communities, when they were self-sufficient, when they were realizing that they could do for self, learning how to negotiate contracts for their labor, learning that they didn't have to work for somebody and just whatever their schedule was from sunup to sundown, learning that they could say, I'm going to charge you this much for my contribution to you and economically I'm valuable. That is what America's greatness is. It was the only glimpse in history where a certain people were allowed to have the same equality to be American citizens. And so for my vision of 2040, we get to that place where we actually enroll the people who are freedmen, a legal status, not just defendant, descendants of slaves, but the freedmen, we restore them and give them what they're entitled to, what they have been promised, what the U.S. Congress passed the law on and said they were going to give them. My dream for 2040 is that those people are actually given what they were promised. Now, some people on this stage wanted to come through Donald Trump. I don't personally care. My concern is, is that when it comes to Donald Trump, it sounds like to me he's saying he wants black people on, on plantations. But even if, even if that's the case, that still doesn't make us competitive enough to catch up to China and India. So that still doesn't make on America great. Who on this stage believes that Donald that Trump That still doesn't make America great, Malik. Thank you. So when I'm talking about restoring people, that if Donald Trump is going to provide the legislation to restore the freedmen, so be it. But if Joe Biden whoever, hadn't done it. You're talking about Donald Trump. Whoever, Joe Biden hadn't done it. Whoever is in office in 2040, the ask for African, the people. Barack who are Obama the, didn't do it. He was a black person. Whoever is in, 20, whoever is in the office in 2040, you have the Bobby, Congress and the Senate. They whoever have not done it. is in office in 2040. My desire is that the freedmen be restored to what they were promised. Tell your Democratic Party and to the do Congress it. Was supposed if to you're do. really concerned about it, hold your party accountable for I, doing I, the very I, things that you. You guys got two minutes. Um, let, let me let me say something. I, I I hope you all, when you think back about this night, notice that every answer that came from the left magically jump back 200 years in the past. I'm, I'm glad we get to answer this question about 2040 because let me say this, any culture 
that pays more attention to the society that its ancestors endured than the one that its descendants will, will inhabit is in trouble, right? I'm, I'm raising, I got three kids. I'm raising my grandchildren's parents right now. So my, my vision, I'm, I'm pointing my scope downrange. I, I can't go back to my ancestors. I honor them, but I can't go back to them. So let me, let me tell you what my vision for, for 2040 is for the black community. One is strong families. I'd love to see a situation where 80% of black kids are born to parents who are married, not conscious co-parenting, not child support court, none of that, Mar married. One man, one woman for one lifetime. I, I'd, I'd like to see us return to the faith of our ancestors. People talk about reparations and all sorts of other stuff. The, the one thing that black folks today don't want to take from their ancestors is the faith that got them through slavery and segregation. I want, I, want, I, want, I want to see not just making the bar in terms of education. I mean, pr progressing. I, wa I want black kids who feel they have just as much opportunity to become a nuclear physicist as they do to play in, to play in the NBA. I want to see entrepreneurship. We don't need more government. Please, let, we, we, we not, and not just black folk, but we as a country have been on, and, and, we have been on that teat so long, we've never seen it engorge because it never gets time to fill back up. So, entrepreneurship, I want us to value life. And the last thing I'll say, I want us to have a positive culture. We should stop commodifying and glorifying black death, the degradation of black women, and drug use in our community. That's my vision for 2040. I have to say, for 2040, I, I see black people uh, in a state of increased unity. Uh, one thing we understand is no matter what side you're on, we're finding problems uh, which, with each party. Uh, when you dog whistle to white supremacy, as the right always does, black people are going to notice. However, if the left, when the left has received, such as Biden and the crime bill, we also address all of those. All of these things is addressing us, and it should let us all know that white supremacy is not a right side or a left side. It's mingled in this government. So what's really going to happen, you're pushing black people away from the Republican Party and away from the Democratic Party. You're pushing us to be independent because we're not seeing any answers coming from either side. When you talk about reparations, you have to talk about ARC. If you don't know what ARC is, that's why critical race theory needs to be taught. ARC is acknowledgement, redress, and closure. My brothers and sisters, white Americans and this government, we get caught up in the acknowledgement. Black people don't need any more apologies from white people. We don't need another apology for what you did. And to be clear, Jim Crow, my brother, was not hundreds of years ago. The survivors of Rosewood is still living, so I would think some of the perpetrators would still be alive, too. The survivors of Rosewood and uh, Black Wall Street is still living. I would think that some of the perpetrators would be alive, too. Jim Crow and Black Codes, that was not in 1865. That was in our grandparents' generation. Some of our grandparents are still living. Some of them need reparations for the abuse that they suffered. You don't know what my mother suffered in the 60s, being told that she had to go to the back of the bus, even though she was lighter than me. She had just enough kinky enough to be told, go to the back of the bus. How do you know how that affects her psychologically? You don't know or you don't care? Which one is it? Well, I have enjoyed tonight. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, moderator. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, moderator. <laughs> Good job. Great job. Great job. Thank you all on behalf of the Walkaway Foundation for joining us tonight. For joining us tonight's Walkaway Black American Culture War Showdown debate. We want to give a huge thank you once again to Dr. Bob Shillman and the Shillman Foundation for sponsoring tonight's event. If you enjoyed tonight's debate and you want to see more content like this, 
please become a monthly recurring supporter of the Walk Away Foundation. Your support will ensure that conversations like this and activism work that encourages free thinking and open discussion and debate can happen all the time across the country. Please go to the walkawayfoundation.org, that's walkawayfoundation.org, and become a generous monthly recurring donor. And if you want to see me, you can find me online, Gothics TV. Thank you, America, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.